Book 2. On the procession of the Holy Spirit, whether he proceeds, as the Greeks hold, only from the Father, or, as the Latins hold, from the Father, and, at the same time, from the Son. Chapter 1. How a dialogue was held in the city of Constantinople on the procession of the Holy Spirit by Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, and Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, and how the translation of the interlocutor's words was done. Since I was resident in the royal city and often exchanged questions on various matters with the Greeks, the devout emperor Kalajan and a certain N, a religious leader of the patriarchal city, decided to hold a public assembly, setting a day when the view of this side and of that might be set forth so that all might hear. Many wise men convened in the Pisan district at the church of Hagia Irene, called Holy Peace in Latin, on the 10th day of April, if memory serves me. The members of the imperial court took their places according to custom. Arbiters were appointed and notaries seated to take down faithfully in writing everything said on either side. Then the whole multitude of listeners fell silent. Many Latins were also present, among them three wise men, fluent in both languages and learned in letters. One, a Venetian by origin, was named James, and another, a Pisan by nationality, was named Burgundio. A third, one, Moses, was eminent even beyond the others, for he was the most illustrious of either people in the teaching of both Greek and Latin letters. He was an Italian by origin, from the city of Bergamo, and was chosen from all the rest to be the faithful interpreter for both sides. Then, when all was ready, the seats arranged by the hearers' respective regions of origin, silence fell, and everyone waited eagerly to listen. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, spoke first thus. Reverend fathers, I did not come here seeking conflict, for the apostle says, not in contention and envy, Romans 13.13. 13. Again he says, if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, 1 Corinthians 11.16. Rather, I have come to inquire concerning and come to know better the faith we share, and above all I have come because you have so wished. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, responded thus, What you say is pleasing, and your humility pleases us as well, for truth emerges more quickly in humble conversation than in any arrogant disputation aimed at victory. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, rejoined thus, we should remember what is written in the gospel when Jesus joined two disciples going from Jerusalem to the village of Emmaus, and they talked together about him. We went with them, and they knew him in the breaking of the bread. Luke 24, 35. So, if we also wish to travel together speaking about the truth without disputing, then that very truth will draw near us. We will recognize this truth in the breaking of bread the opening up of divine scriptures. Therefore, let us walk together in the path of charity, not contending in prideful argument, but following the path of truth together, searching it out humbly. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, then said thus, It seems to me that the appointed interpreter should translate what we are about to say word for word, because in this way we can better understand each other, and he can easily do this. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, replied thus, But I do not speak in this way, and such translation is suspect in my view, because I can be misunderstood word by word if the translation is inexact, and we should not quibble over words. Rather, the translation between us should gather and then set forth our respective speech as it develops in its full meaning. In this way of speaking and translating, we shall examine thoughts rather than be fixed on their expression. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, then said thus, Let it be as you say, for this pleases me if it pleases you. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, responded thus, I wish to suggest something further. We propose to address a difficult question, but I was called suddenly to this conference and have reflected on none of this before. 
even yesterday or the day before yesterday. Therefore, I beg the consideration of all sitting and standing here that if some word offensive to the ears of some of you escapes me, as sometimes happens in such situations, you not immediately clap your hands against me, but wait patiently, with your accustomed courtesy, remembering that I am a guest among you, because I was fearful of just such quick offenses in word-for-word translation, and I ask that our conversation not be so treated. So let no battle of words arise between us, but let us carefully discern the truth of each other's thoughts. Nicetus, Bishop of Nicomedia, responded thus, You have spoken well. I, too, request this very thing. The whole crowd then affirmed, This is good, an honorable way to proceed, so be it, so be it. Anselm, Bishop of Appleburg, then said thus, Following holy and apostolic teaching, we believe and teach that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God in substance, three in their persons. We also believe that the Father is begotten of no other, that the Son is begotten by the Father, and that the Holy Spirit proceeds from both, that is, from both the Father and the Son, we believe and we teach this. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, replied thus, You say that these things are Catholic teachings and that we must accept them, but you say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son just as from the Father. With this we do not agree, nor do we accept it, for no rational argument nor authority of canonical scriptures, finally no general counsel says or teaches this very thing. Anselm, Bishop of Avalberg, answered thus, You have posited three supports for your position, namely, reason, the authority of the canonical scriptures, and general counsels. You posited reason first. Therefore, I should like first to know by what reasoning you are prevented from believing or stating that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son just as from the Father. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, replied thus, In all learning, but especially in lofty theology, we must fear polyarchia, that is, multiplicity of principles. The wisest of the Greeks have indeed avoided it thus far, as indeed they also have avoided anarchia, that is, the absence of principle. On the other hand, those same sages have carefully identified monarchia, that is, singularity of principle, teaching us to accept this reverently. Thence they have refused to accept that God be of plural principles, polyarchos, for this would only impute conflict to him, as they have said. But neither have they wished to acknowledge that God might be anarchos, without principle, because, as they have said, anything without principle is disordered. So the Greek sages, appropriately avoiding the latter two positions, have thoughtfully turned to reverent acceptance of monarchia. So we too reverently accept and embrace this notion. All orthodoxy must accept it. Further, if there were two principles, Either the two would, by themselves, be respectively insufficient, or the second would be superfluous. For if something were lacking to the prior of the two, that first principle would not be supremely perfect. At the same time, if nothing were lacking to the first, given the presence of the second, and if everything were present in the first, then the second would be superfluous. So we believe that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God, the Father begotten by no other, the Son truly begotten by the Father, and the Holy Spirit proceeding only from the Father and not from the Son. If we were to say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son, such that the Father were the principle of the Holy Spirit, and likewise the Son the principle of the Spirit, then we would be imputing two principles to the Spirit, and we would err in attributing polyarchia, that is, plurality of principles, to that spirit. But this is contrary to all reason. Therefore, we believe and teach that the Father is the principle of the Son, whom he begot, and the same Father is the principle of the Holy Spirit, who proceeded from him alone. Thus we affirm that the Father is the principle of both, not in time, but in cause. For both are from the Father, as if from one principle, the one by begetting and the other by procession, not temporally, but causally. Chapter 2. 
that in the Lord there is not anarchia, absence of principle, nor is there polyarchia, plurality of principle, but rather monarchia, singularity of principle. Anselm, Bishop of Avalberg, then said thus, With you I deny plurality of principles in God, that he might be polyarchon, as you say, since that is contrary to all reason. A certain Asiarch called Mains, a Persian by nationality, from whom arose the Manichaeans, who polluted nearly all of Africa, was rightly condemned by the Catholic Church for arguing the existence of two principles and for teaching several other things contrary to the Christian faith. I utterly reject, as you do, that God might be what you term anarchos, that is, that there be in God an absence of principle or no principle, because God, unless he were himself the highest of principles, would then exist without himself, and if he were to exist without himself, then certainly he would not exist at all. Therefore, we must say neither that God has multiple principles, else he would be in conflict with himself, nor that he has no principle, else he would lack order, each of those alternatives threatens his dissolution and destruction. For, if we say that God has multiple principles, then much conflict must follow. Or, if we say that God has no principle, no order would maintain. Either case, I repeat, is entirely absurd, since again either predicates God's dissolution and destruction. In the first instance, because of conflict, and in the second, because of disorder. Therefore, with you I maintain that God has one principle, as you say that he is monarchos, since he is himself the highest and complete principle, and he is himself patently his own principle. What might be beyond him and outside him would be without principle, but nothing of this sort exists. So, God has no multiplicity of principles, nor is he without principle. Rather, he is his own unique principle in himself alone possessing absolute and exclusive monarchical power. Just as he is his own life by which he lives, so too is he his own principle by which he is governed. But you say that if the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and from the Son, two principles then exist. I judge, though, that your argument should by no means be accepted with such hastily constructed proof. In fact, your false inference does not follow from your premise. It is true that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and from the Son, but false that there are therefore two principles. So your argument falls apart. Pay attention, then, in all charity. We say, for our part, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and from the Son, but we do not concede that God, therefore, has two principles, because the Father and the Son together are one principle, just as they are one God. In the same way we say that God comes from God, yet not that there are two gods. Again, similarly we say in figurative terms that light comes from light, yet we do not mean two lights of different substance. We say, too, that wisdom comes from wisdom, yet not that two wisdoms exist. So, too, we say rightly that a principle comes from a principle, yet not that there are two principles. When the Lord was asked in the gospel, Who art thou? He responded thus, The beginning, who also speaks unto you. John 8, 25. So he revealed himself to be one and the same principle as the Father in unity with that Father's substance, but from that principle in his person as Son. Certainly we must consider what is said in the Gospel, about what it was said, for what reason, and in what way. For since the Lord says thus, the beginning who also speak unto you, and since he does not say, the beginning and I am speaking to you, he clearly meant that he is one with the Father in common substance, but not one with the Father in distinction of his person. For the Son is the same principle as the Father himself in his substance, but not the same as the Father in his person. We can also understand this in another way in his saying thus, The beginning, who also speak unto you, that is, that he also wishes to reveal himself to be the creator, the principle of creation, just as the Father is the principle of creation, because all things are from him. Thus, in the book of Genesis, 
in the beginning God created heaven and earth, Genesis 1-2. So here, the evangelist John, saying that Christ himself is the principle in the beginning and with the beginning, thus, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, etc. All things were made by him, and without him was made nothing that was made. In him was life. John 1, 1 through 4. And in the Psalms, with thee is the principality in the day of thy strength. Psalm 109, 3. Consequently, we call the Father in relation to creation the principle from which all things exist. We also call the Son in relation to creation the principle through whom all things exist. And we further call the Holy Spirit in relation to creation the principle in whom all things exist. Yet these are not three principles. They are not three creators, since the works of the Trinity are inseparable. Therefore God as one, not as two or three, is called the principle in relation to creation. Just as these principles relate mutually within the Trinity, the one who begets is the principle of the one begotten, that is, the Father is the principle of the Son because he begets him. Whether the Father is rightly called the principle of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit proceeds from him, and whether the Son is rightly called the principle of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit also proceeds from him is doubtful to some. But if the one given, the Holy Spirit, has as his principle that very other by whom he is given, and if indeed he takes his principle from no other source than him whence he proceeds, then we must acknowledge that the Father and the Son together are the principle of the Holy Spirit. Yet Father and Son are not therefore two principles, because just as the Father and the Son are one God, so too in relation to the Holy Spirit they are one principle. Clearly then, the Holy Spirit is given and proceeds from nowhere other than the Father and the Son together as one principle. The Father is the principle and the Son is the same principle. For if the Son were other than the Father, then he would not be the same principle as the Father. He would already exist in this other thing and would cease being a principle. Therefore, let us attribute to the Son whatever we have attributed to the Father. If the Father is in the Son and the Son is in the Father and if everything of the Father Father is also of the Son, while everything of the Son is also of the Father, then the Father's principle is the Son's principle, that is, the principle that is the Father is the principle that is the Son. So, the Holy Spirit, proceeding from both, namely from the Father and Son, has a singular principle in his procession, not two principles. We then describe the principle in the Father as in three modes, that is, in substance, in regard to himself, in relation, in regard to the other person persons of the Trinity, as Father to Son, and again in relation as Creator in regards to creation. Chapter 3. That that which is eternal is not therefore without a principle, for the Son is co-eternal with the Father, but he is not without a principle, because he is from the Father. Perhaps you wonder that co-eternal beings are not called synarcha mutual principles, or co-beginnings. There we must note that whatever has no principle is eternal. But what is eternal is not on that account without principle. To be sure, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three persons, entirely, mutually, co-eternal, and co-equal, but they are not at the same time entirely without principle. For the Father is indeed anarchos, without principle, yet he is the co-equal principle of his co-eternal and consubstantial Son. So he is the principle, with respect to cause, source, and eternal light. Although the Son is co-eternal and consubstantial with the Father, nevertheless he is in no way an archos, without principle, since he has the Father as his principle and cause, and the Father himself is the principle of the universe. Rather, when I say the word principle, you should not infer any intervention of time or interpose of anything between him who begets and him who is begotten. 
nor should you think to divide their nature by some ill-conceived and ill-established separation between persons always coeternal. If time were older than the sun, then the father would be the first cause of time rather than of the sun. The sun would then not have been the maker of temporal succession, but would have existed in time. Nor would the sun have been the lord of all by nature, but rather assumed into the power of the father by grace, or not even have been lord at all. In sum, the Son would be cast out from deity as not coeternal with the Father, but constituted under time. Therefore, the Father is the principle of the Son in respect to cause, and the Father is, with the Son, the principle of the Holy Spirit in respect to cause. But a cause is clearly not prior in time to those things it causes any more than the Son is older than its own light. Thus, evidently all three persons are mutually co-eternal and co-equal, but the three are not alike in lacking a causal principle. The Father is, as you say, an archos, that is, without temporal or causal principle, because he exists of himself, not from anywhere outside himself. But the Son is not an archos, for he has the Father not as his temporal, but as his causal principle." If you understand his principle as outside of time in the sense that the Son is also an archos, and the Holy Spirit too is an archos without a principle in time, the Trinity, the maker of temporal succession, did not indeed begin with time or under time. All the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together is one God. So too it embraces one and the same principle, as you call it monarchos, Pantokraton, that is, one in principle, one in authority, governing all things in his substance. The Trinity expresses no duality of principle in your terms, then is not diarchos or triarchos. So we read in the Athanasian Creed, honored throughout the Church, that the Father is eternal, the Son eternal, and the Holy Spirit eternal, yet there are not three eternal beings but one. The Father is beyond measure, the Son beyond Beyond measure and the Holy Spirit beyond measure, and yet there are not three immeasurable entities but one. And the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods but one. The Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, and the Holy Spirit is Lord, yet there are not three lords but one. So too the Father is the principle, the Son is the principle, and the Holy Spirit is the principle, yet there are not three principles but one. All together and at the same time are one principle, but each is in himself a complete and perfect principle. But although we rightly call the three persons consubstantial, yet we do not properly say that they are consubstances. So perhaps we rightly say that the three persons are principles together, yet we do not rightly call them three mutual principles, as the Greeks say they are synarcha, for which notion the Latins have no term. Now, perhaps, someone wishing only to argue, or someone led astray by a false opinion, thinks then that two principles might be said to exist, because when a principle is said to lack its own principle, or again, if a principle is said to be from another principle, there seem then to be two principles. But such an argument omits to note that we rightly say that God is not from God as Father, but as Son. Yet, there are not on this account two gods. Again, we rightly say that light is not from light and yet is indeed from light, but there are not two lights. Then, if we said that the principle is the Father, is not the principle that is the Son, and that the principle that is the Son is not the principle that is the Father, and from this we wish to infer two principles, then we would be altogether mistaken, since we may not call the principle that is the Father the principle that is the Son, and when we say that the principle that is the Son is not the principle that is the Father, we understand or state nothing else than that the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father, even as we always distinguish their person. So, according to the distinction of persons, we rightly state this negatively thus, that the principle that is the Father is not the principle that is the Son, and the principle that is the Son is not the principle that is the Father. But according to the identity of their shared essence, we rightly state positively that the Father is the same principle as the Son, and the Son is the same principle as the Father. Although the one is not the other, nevertheless, that one is what the other is. Although the one is not the same as the other, nevertheless, it is the same as what the 
other is. And although the other is not the same, it is that which he is. Nor is the one the other, but they are both the very same thing. Always one God, always one principle. Never are there two gods, never two majesties, never two principles. Then... If the Holy Spirit does not proceed from the Son, as you consider is the case, show if you can how he might not truly proceed from the Father. For if, as you say, we must believe that the Spirit does not proceed from the Son, we must also believe, although you deny this, that he does not proceed from the Father, since the Father and the Son are one. As Christ himself says thus, I and the Father are one. John 10.30 Again he says thus, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Therefore he who says that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father who is in the Son must also say the same Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son who is in the Father. Or, if he denies that the Spirit proceeds from the Son, he is also forced to deny that the same Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father who is in the Son, for the Father and the Son are one. When we say in turn that the Son is in the Father, then we understand that the one is in the other, not as difference in substance, but as one and the same in substance. Thus the Lord answered Philip's demand, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us by saying thus, Philip, he that seeth me seeth the Father also, etc., because I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, John 14, 8 through 9. On this account, we speak of the unity of the Son's substance with the Father's. And when the text says, I and the Father are one, the word one refers to the unity of their substance. This point is against Arius. And the word are refers to the plurality of their persons. This latter point is against Sibelius. It is as if the Son said, I and the Father are one, that is, I am what he is according to substance. So in this way, we seem to have concluded that while you wish to persuade me not to believe that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son, so that I do not fall into the error of asserting two principles, you are therefore compelled to deny what you first believe, that is, that the Holy Spirit proceeds only from the Father. In this you have fallen into such a snare that, although you set out to deny procession from the Son and affirm something else, procession from the Father, now either you dare confess neither according to your prior position or, to affirm rightly as I do, according to the Catholic faith and the argument we have set forth. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, then responded thus, your reasoning about this matter of principle is compelling. But while you say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, you do not admit two principles, and you demonstrate this through the unity of the Father and Son. By the same reasoning, we might prove that the same Holy Spirit proceeds from himself as from the Father and the Son, since Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one divine essence. Thus, if he proceeds from those others with whom he is one in substance, we must also say that he proceeds from himself as one in substance with the other persons. Chapter 4. That just as the Father begot, but did not beget himself, and just as the Son was begotten, but not by himself, so too the Holy Spirit proceeds, but not from himself. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, then said thus, The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Yet there are not three gods, but one. And although we say rightly that God the Father begot God the Son, since there is one God, nevertheless, we cannot rightly say about God the Father, God the Father begot himself, nor can we rightly say of God the Son, God the Son was begotten by himself. So too, although the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God, and we rightly believe that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, nevertheless we cannot therefore correctly say that he proceeds from himself. Although the Spirit is one in substance with the Father and the Son, he is by no means the same as the Father or the Son, such that he might proceed from himself, 
as he proceeds from them. Therefore, just as the Father begot but did not beget himself, and just as the Son was begotten but not by himself, so too the Holy Spirit proceeds but not from himself. The Gospel of John reveals this in the text about the Holy Spirit thus, For he shall not speak of himself, but what things soever he shall hear he shall speak. John sixteen thirteen. This speech will not come from the Holy Spirit, because he is not of himself, and because he is not of himself, neither does he whose essence is the same as that which proceeds proceed from himself. Therefore, whence he exists... Thence he proceeds, and whence he proceeds, thence he exists. His being consists in his procession, just as the role proper to the Father is to beget the Son, and just as the role proper to the Son is for the Father to beget him, so too the role proper to the Holy Spirit is to proceed from both as if from one principle. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, answered thus, we intended to treat of the procession of the Holy Spirit, but in order to prove your opinion, you have adduced your thought on the Father as begetting and the Son as begotten. You have done so appropriately, for I acknowledge that your arguments are satisfying. But respond now to this question thus. What is the procession of the Holy Spirit of which we speak, or how does it occur? Does it seem true to you that we must say that the Holy Spirit proceeds according to the substance common to the other persons or according to his discreet and proper person? Chapter 5. That just as we do not understand how the Father is begotten by no other, or the Son is begotten, so too we do not understand how the Holy Spirit eternally proceeds. Anselm. Bishop of Avelberg then said thus, Tell me how the Father is begotten by no other, and how the Son is begotten, and I shall then tell you how the Holy Spirit proceeds. But we should both be foolish to pry so into divine mysteries, wishing to find rational explanation for these things which we know to be ineffable, beyond all the comprehension of any rational creature. They surpass all human even all angelic understanding in their profundity and sublimity. But if you press me, and if you wish to be irksome over this question, then suffice it to hear what it suffices for me to believe, that is, the Father is begotten by no other, the Son is begotten, and the Holy Spirit proceeds. This is enough for my belief. As I see it, how the Father is begotten by no other, how the Son is begotten, or how the third person proceeds should be honored in reverent silence. Our role is so to believe these great matters as not to investigate how they are, so with our intellectual curiosity, for us to understand how is granted not even to the angels, much less to us. But the Father who begot, the Son who was begotten, and the Holy Spirit who proceeded from both all understand the Son's divine eternal generation, and the Holy Spirit's divine, eternal procession, in that conscious rationality only they eternally possess. So they know the matter and character of the Spirit's generation and procession. But these matters are inaccessible to the dark cloud of human lowliness in which vanity sometimes works against truth. Yet I think that we say appropriately that the Father always was and is begotten by no other, that the Son always was and is as begotten, and that the Holy Spirit always was and is as proceeding. The Father's begetting accords with that Father's essence, the Son's being begotten at the same time accords with His essence, and the Holy Spirit's procession accords correspondingly with that very Spirit's essence. Neither one nor the other is before or after with respect to time. Chapter 6 That being is one thing in the highest Trinity, and another thing in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, in that highest trinity, 
The act of begetting does not constitute being, nor does being begotten, nor does procession. For the Father does not exist for that reason, nor does the Son, nor the Holy Spirit, yet therefore their substance is one in the Trinity. But in respect to the Father's begetting, the Son's being begotten, and the Holy Spirit's coming forth in procession, their persons are not one, but three. In substance, rather than in essence, in which they are three, they are also one. Yet in the personality by which the three are distinguished, they are again three. As I have said, in the Trinity, there is no being who is the Father, nor is there the Son, nor is the Holy Spirit who proceeds, rather that being who is God, great, good, and wise. And the three persons are proper to each respectively, even as each alone and all together are one in substance. Chapter 7 why the Holy Spirit alone is so called, and why he is the third person of the Trinity, that this is not a level of dignity, but an order of enumeration and the designation of a distinct person. Certainly the Father is a spirit, and he is holy, but he is not the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. The Son, too, is a spirit and holy, but neither is he the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Likewise, the Holy Spirit is a spirit and holy, but he alone is rightly called the Holy Spirit and the third person of the Trinity. Perhaps for this reason the Holy Spirit alone is properly called the Holy Spirit, that is, that he alone, by the breath of deity, joins himself and the other two together in one essence, ineffably distinguishing and wondrously conjoining their unity and trinity and their trinity and unity. Therefore, let us believe that their highest unity and trinity embraces both distinct persons and persons conjoined distinctly, a paradox completely beyond all human understanding, inconceivable to it. So the Holy Spirit is the co-eternal bond between the other two persons, the communion of those two and their concord, charity, sweetness, and sanctity. For what sort of being is God the Father if not holy? And what is the Son of God if not holy? If you take away this holiness from God the Father or from God the Son, in removing it you remove also their divinity. For how might divinity not be holy? Would it not be imperfect if it were not holy? Would that divinity not rather be nothing at all if it were not holy? Therefore, because the Holy Spirit, as I have said, is the co-eternal holiness of the other two, we rightly say that this Holy Spirit is one with the Father and the Son in their common holiness, fulfilling the Trinity in the character of his person. Further, the unity of the substance the Spirit shares with him is undivided, simple, and one in him. It remains so eternally undivided, simple, and one in him, since no number is ever withdrawn from him. This, for us, is the one God. The plurality of divine persons originates in unity eternally and causally, not temporally. It is moved, as I have thus said, toward duality, but is co-eternal in its procession, so remaining eternally in the co-eternal trinity and embracing the number of the Holy Trinity outside all time. This trinity is for us the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are one, although they are three in number, since one person is the Father's, another's the Son, and another the Holy Spirit's. And and although only one person is the Father's, two persons are the Father's and the Son's, and three persons are the Father's, Son's, and Holy Spirit's, but still no difference in dignity can be discerned in the same co-eternal trinity. Nowhere in any writing of those who treat of the Holy Trinity, as I believe, do we find, as if in order of dignity, first the person of the Father and second the person of the Son. We sometimes find the person of the Holy Spirit as the third person in the Trinity, but we say this not not according to his level of dignity, but in distinction or designation of his discreet and singular person. For the Trinity is not ordered successively in dignity, rather is contained by a number and equal in dignity, so that indeed it embraces three persons continually and at once. The first, second, and third persons are not so called in rank, that is, in their respective degrees of discreet and ordered dignity. Rather, the very number three indicates in its plurality not degrees of respective dignity, but the plurality of the Trinity. Further, 
When the Holy Spirit is called the third person in the Trinity, he is not called third with respect to the first or second person, as if he were lesser in dignity, but he is called third, that is, one among three, by the particular designation of his person. Augustine, that bishop of the city of Hippo, and outstanding doctor, spoke thus when he wrote to Orosius, And the Spirit of the Lord, the third person in the Trinity, was born over the waters. Again, he wrote in the book of questions on the Old and New Testament in chapter 113 thus, Why should the Son of God be sent and not another? The devil wished to be called God after God the Father. He strives after that even now, although he can never happen because the Son of God is second after God the Father, not in nature, but in order. Likewise, Augustine said in the same book, in chapter 195, writing against Eusebius, The Holy Spirit is third in order, not in nature, not in rank, not in divinity, nor in person, nor in ignorance, just as the Son of God is second to the Father, but not lesser in divinity. So, too, the Holy Spirit follows after the Son, not as unequal, but as equal in the divinity of his substance. So Hilary, Bishop of Poitiers, a famous and eloquent defender of the universal faith in ancient times, said in On Trinity, Book 12, the Son is the true God from you, O God the Father. We must thus confess him after you and with you as begotten by you, because you are the eternal author of his eternal origin. For because he is from you, he is second to you. He is second, I say, in his mode of existence, not in the degree of his dignity. Indeed, the Son sits next to God the Father as if in the first place, while the Holy Spirit sits as in the second place from the Father, but next to the Son. Hence, the priest Jerome, learned in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew letters, also calls the Father the principal spirit in the Son, saying in his work on the three virtues thus, David assumes three spirits in the psalm, saying, Strengthen me with a perfect spirit, Psalm 50.14. Renew a right spirit within my bowels, Psalm 50.12. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me, Psalm 50.13. Who are these three spirits? The perfect spirit is the Father. The right spirit is the Son. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit himself. And so the Holy Spirit is second from the Father, but first after Christ according to the order in which we speak of him, naming him so in an orderly and proper mode, that is, according to the way of being and pattern of numbering and hearing in their persons, not according to any difference in their dignity. Certainly, the Father is from no one, the Son is from the Father alone, and the Holy Spirit draws his being from them both. Therefore, you should imagine, as I have done, no lesser degree of dignity or nature, rather an order in mode of being and in order of speaking. Likewise, Augustine says in his book of questions on the Old and New Testament, chapter 22, regarding their origin thus, the Son differs in no way from the Father. Certainly he does not differ at all in substance, because he is the true Son. Yet he differs in cause or in order, because all potency from the Father is in the Son. So even if in substance the Son is not lesser, nevertheless in authority the Father is greater, as the Lord himself gives witness when he says thus, if you loved me, you would indeed be glad because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. John fourteen twenty eight. The Apostle Paul shares this interpretation, saying thus, There is but one God, the Father, of whom all things and we unto him, and one Lord Jesus, etc., by whom all things and we by him. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Thus, 
The first in order is that of which all things are. The second is that by which all things are. The third is that in which all things are. None of them is lesser, but all are indicated in the unity of God. As the apostle says thus, For of him and by him and in him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Romans eleven thirty six. So, reason demands and Catholic faith teaches that in our designation of the Trinity, such proper order of verbal expression be observed, that is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Although equal in dignity, they cannot be named in speech at one and the same time, and although they share the unity of the selfsame majesty, they also maintain the Trinity as discreet in personality, but with no distinction of dignity, yet admitting of order in oral expression. The Son of God himself, who knew all, plainly taught this order in the Trinity when he spoke thus to the disciples, going therefore teach ye all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew twenty-eight nineteen. Chapter 8. That the names of the Trinity may be transposed. Some, though, are accustomed to judge the Holy Spirit to be lesser, because he is third in order. Even though divine scriptures present such transparent simplicity, that sometimes we find the third placed first because he is at issue in a given passage. It then does no injury to any of the persons, since their divinity is one. So we read in Isaiah that the Lord says thus, I am the first, and I am the last. My hand also hath founded the earth, and my right hand hath measured the heavens. Isaiah 48, 12-13 And below, I even have spoken and called him. I have brought him, and his way is made prosperous. Come ye near unto me, and hear this thus. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time before it was done, I was there, and now the Lord God hath sent me in his spirit. Isaiah 48, 15 through 16. Whom do we think founded the earth? It is he who says, I am the first, and it is he who says that he was sent. Do we think that this is the Father because he says, I am the first? Far from it, for what follows, and now the Lord God hath sent me, and his Spirit clearly shows that he is the Son, saying that he was sent by God and with the Holy Spirit. Yet he says, I am the first. Behold these equalities between the Son and the Holy Spirit. Just as we read that the Holy Spirit was sent by the Father and the Son, so too Christ was sent by God and the Holy Spirit. Only the Father is not said to have been sent. Let us also note the words of the Apostle, who expresses the Trinity in another order. For he says, among other things, in the second letter to the Thessalonians, May the Lord direct your hearts into the charity of God and the patience of Christ. 2 Thessalonians 3, 5. Whom do you think? He calls Lord here, but the Holy Spirit, who directs our hearts into the love of God, that Father who sent his Son, and into the patience of that Christ who was obedient to his Father even unto death. And in the first letter to the Corinthians, departing from the order traditional in the faith, the Apostle begins with the Holy Spirit in mentioning the ministry and actions of grace, then adds the Lord Jesus, and places God third, whom he says works in the Holy Spirit and in the Lord. So the Lord himself says thus, The Father who abideth, he doth the works. John 14, 10. Because of this, because the Holy Spirit and Christ are from God the Father, their action is the work of God. Further, the Apostle speaks of the Holy Spirit and the Lord as the same Lord and God. And he does so on account of the unity of their nature. Therefore, after the Apostle says here that the same God works all things in all, he concludes thus, But all these things one and the same Spirit worketh, dividing to every one according as he will. 1 Corinthians 12, 11. So we say, 
in transposing the order of personal names in the Trinity that the three are one in action, because when one acts, three are also properly said to act. Why? Because the persons are one in divinity. Their names may be positioned in any order at all. In the 50th Psalm, David prays, invoking God as spirit, and transposes the names of the three persons in simple faith, believing that the three persons of the divinity have the same nature. Create a clean heart in me, O God, and renew a right spirit within my bowels. Psalm 50, 12. Here, the psalmist called Christ the right spirit. And again, Cast me not away from thy face, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Psalm 50, 13. He called the Holy Spirit himself this Holy Spirit. Below, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and strengthen me with a perfect spirit. Psalm 50, 14. There he called the Father the perfect spirit, that Father who is his own principle and first cause, indeed the causal principle of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And John says in the Apocalypse thus, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and end, saith the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Revelation 1.8 And below, I am the first and the last, etc., was dead and behold, I am living. Revelation 1.17-8 Likewise below, thus says the first and the last who was dead and is alive. Revelation 2, 8. Behold, we see the simplicity of Scripture, how it transposes the names of the Trinity at one time, placing the Father either before or after, at another time the Son, at another the Holy Spirit. This in no way opposes that universal faith, confessing the three to be the same nature. Chapter 9. That Father... Son and Holy Spirit are not deficient, rather sufficient as names, signifying no lessening or diminution of substance. We must also know that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are by no means deficient as names, implying that the Father is deficient because he is not the Son or the Holy Spirit, or because the Son is not the Father or the Holy Spirit he himself is deficient, or because the Holy Spirit is not the Father or the Son, he either is deficient in this sense. They are rather full and sufficient names, signifying no lessening or diminution of substance. Moreover, we call one the Father, another the Son, and another the Holy Spirit, so that the three hypostases, that is, the three persons may be described without confusion as one in nature and their dignity as deity. And, although, when three persons are mentioned, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a plurality of persons occurs to the understanding as these linguistic expressions are apprehended. The unity of their same essence should never recede from the faith and understanding of believers. When the phrase, One God, is spoken... Although the unity of the divine essence presents itself to a human understanding that is by itself incomplete, according to the proper meaning of this linguistic expression, nevertheless the plurality of divine persons should rightly remain in the faith and understanding of believers. Just as we believe in our hearts, so too let us confess with our mouths the unity of the divine substance. Nevertheless, preserving their trinity of persons, and let us confess their trinity of persons while preserving the unity of divine essence. So, our usage of the term one is not Sibylian, but Christian, nor does it consist in a confused unity of persons, but in the true and simple unity of the same substance. In the same way, our usage of the term three is not Arian, but Catholic, nor does it consist in a plurality of substances, but in the correct distinction of persons. Let us not, dashing against the promontory of either Arian or Sibylian impiety, drown in that morass. Many have ventured there, and navigating carelessly have suffered the shipwreck of heretical damnation. Such persons dispute often and greatly about the faith, but never attain to its truth. 
Meanwhile, they are ignorant of the things which they speak and declare. If only the poverty of human speech could devise a single name appropriately and sufficiently signifying the unity of God's substance, as well as the trinity of his persons, to the point of full and sufficient understanding. Surely, then the Church of God, which has labored so often to explain the many words and names for God faithfully, in many ways, would labor less in both its language and belief. Yet, the Christian faith does not consist in the confession of mere names and words, but in the pure truth of trinity and unity. Truth and healthful confession arises from the very truth that the true God is one and that truly he is the true trinity in his persons. Therefore, when the Father is called God, the Son is called God, and the Holy Spirit is also called God. No one thinks that there is a tritheia, that is, three deities or a triple deity. Rather, since the three are of the same nature, their divinity and honor are rightly understood to be as one, as I believe the Greeks term it, homo temia. Neither is it fitting for Christians to be said to be tritheitai, that is, worshippers of three gods, but rather monotheitai, that is, worshippers of one god. <laughs> Chapter 10. That we say that the Holy Spirit proceeds not according to the substance he has in common with the other persons, nor according to his own person, that is, in himself, rather in his relation to the other persons. As for the question you asked, whether, we say, the Holy Spirit proceeds according to his substance as in common with the other persons, or according to his distinct and proper person, I respond thus, the Holy Spirit is consubstantial with the Father and the Son. No different substance comes from a same substance. So his substance is common to all three persons as one and the same God. So too is it common to them as one and the same substance. Yet we say that the Father is begotten by no other. The Son is begotten and the Holy Spirit proceeds neither according to their common substance nor according to person. For if we say that the Father is begotten of no other, the Son begotten, and the Holy Spirit proceeds according to that substance in which they are one, then according to that common substance we might say that the Father is both begotten of no other and begotten, and also that he proceeds. Thence would arise a kind of new and confused mixture of the one who is begotten of no other, the one begotten and the one proceeding. For whatever we say about the divine substance according to substance must be common to all three. There Therefore, if we say that according to their substance the Father is begotten of no other, that the Son is begotten, and that the Holy Spirit proceeds, then each attribute must be common to all three, such that we say that the Father is at once begotten of no other, begotten and proceeding. Likewise, we term the Son begotten of no other, begotten and proceeding, and also call the Holy Spirit begotten of no other, begotten and proceeding. In this great confusion, neither the clear trinity of their persons nor complete identity of their substance would remain. On the other hand, if we say that the one who is begotten of no other, the one begotten and the one who proceeds exist respectively in substance, then he who is begotten of no other can neither be the one begotten nor the one proceeding. Neither is the one begotten also begotten of no other nor he who proceeds, and neither is the one proceeding either he who is begotten of no other or the one begotten, for then they would not exist in unity of substance, rather in three different substances according to which we would say the one begotten of no other, the one begotten and the one proceeding were different from each other. So the Trinity would not be homoousion of the same substance, but heterousion of diverse substances. In this understanding, the confusion and commingling of persons would, on the one hand, throw us into a pit of civilian heresy, on the other, the plurality of substances would tumble us into the depths of Arianism. Therefore, we do not say the Holy Spirit proceeds according to his substance, although his procession is in his substance. Further, if we say the Holy Spirit proceeds according to his person, 
person, we raise the same absurdity. For we speak of his name and person in the lofty, ineffable, and incomprehensible trinity as in relation to himself, and whatever we say of him is according to his substance. Thus, we properly speak of his person in his substance, for clearly that person is subject to his nature, and we cannot speak of him except in his nature. So, in the case of the trinity, when we speak of the person of the Father, we also mean the substance of the Father. When we speak of the person of the Son, we also mean the substance of the Son. And when we speak of the person of the Holy Spirit, we mean to the substance of the Holy Spirit. Although in each case we mention only one substance, the three persons always exist and we refer also to them. Therefore, because we speak of each person in respect to his substance, in relation to himself, we say that the Holy Spirit proceeds, but no more according to his person than to his substance. Finally, we must say that just as we call the Father by the term Father in relation to the Son and begotten of no other in relation to the one begotten, and just as we call the Son of God by the Son and the one begotten, and he who is also called word, image, seal, character, and splendor in relation to the Father, so too we call the Holy Spirit in relation to the others by him who proceeds. He is sent from each who sends him as a gift from each, giving him as love from each in his love. Here we must note about what, according to what, and on account of what we speak, since we speak of things in relation to themselves as according to substance. But as for things of which we speak otherwise than in relation to themselves, these we treat in relation to the distinction of their persons, since the very term person was invented because of the poverty of words by which the ancients might express the meaning of the Trinity. We use it not in relation to itself, rather in reference to itself, that is, regarding its substance or essence. Indeed, we employ, among the other usages of the Latin language, similar terms for similar beings such as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not using them collectively, but rather in reference to each respectively. At the same time, we use those terms referring to common character, such as substance, God, omnipotent, and the other terms of this sort, not only in respective but also in collective reference. For just as the Father alone is called Father, and the Son alone is called Son, and the Holy Spirit alone is called the Holy Spirit, all terms referring specifically to singular persons, so too we rightly call all three, both collectively and respectively, God, substance, omnipotent, and other names of this sort. These terms are just as appropriate respectively as they are to all three persons collectively. In this way, just as we speak of things differing in number and person as different in number, so too we term those alike in number and substance as alike again in substance. Chapter 11. Whether we rightly say that the Son, like the Father, sends forth the Holy Spirit, as the Greeks say, that the Son is proboleus. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, then replied thus, What you have said is fair enough, but I ask now whether you concede that the Father sends forth the Holy Spirit as it proceeds, and is then probolios, as the Greeks say. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, answered thus, I do not know what probolios may mean, since I am not Greek, but rather a Latin. But I gladly concede that the Father sends forth the Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit is then truly sent. I also say, however, that the Son likewise sends forth the Spirit. For the Gospel clearly says this of both the Father and Son. About the Father it says thus, The Paraclete, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, John fourteen twenty six, And about the Son thus, When the Paraclete cometh whom I will send you, John fifteen twenty six. The gospel says further, But if I go, I will send him to you. John sixteen seven. Thus the Father sends forth the Holy Spirit, and also the Son does. The Holy Spirit is sent by both, yet promised by the one that is by the Son. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, said thus, If the Father and the Son both send forth the Holy Spirit, then there are two who send him, two who give him. Thus there seem to be two principles of the Holy Spirit. 
Anselm, Bishop of Avalberg, responded thus. As I see it, you wish cunningly to bring up the problem of two principles against me. Moreover, you raise again what we decided above when we treated the matter of principle. But now, as if in casual question, as though you had forgotten what we already said, still nowhere in Scripture do I find two principles. Your concern is whether we can rightly say that two send the Spirit forth or two give him, that there might be two of him who the Greeks name Proboleos, and whom we call, as you say, him who sends forth. But since the exact meaning of this Greek term is unclear to me, I do not for now wish to define it precisely. Rather, I wish that you listen to me patiently. You say that the Holy Spirit does not proceed from the Son. When you say this, you do great wrong to both Son and Holy Spirit. Since the Father and the Son are in respect to each other, he who begets and he who is begotten, and likewise the Father and the Holy Spirit, are in respect to each other, he who sends forth and he who is sent, as the giver and the one given. Since this is so, I beg that you tell me whether you do not greatly wrong both Son and Holy Spirit when you attribute to them no mutual relation, or worse, when you disjoin them from shared procession, as I have said. Why is it that the Son bears the Holy Spirit only some neutral relation, or the Holy Spirit is thus in respect to the Son, if you take away the procession of the one from the other from between the two? They clearly are, as I have said, Father and Son in mutual respect by generation, or as I again have said, the Father and the Holy Spirit are in mutual respect by procession. But in your view, the Son and the Holy Spirit then remain without any mutuality or relationship in which to regard one another. And what is this but to some extent to dissolve the supreme and venerable trinity? Chapter 12. That the Holy Spirit is the symponia, that is, the concord, and the sin neusis, that is, the mutual relation of the other two persons. Truly, the Holy Spirit is a symponia, that is, the concord, and the synneusis, that is, the mutual relation of the others. He partakes in the holiness proper and natural to the Father and the Son in their common substance, but is distinct in person, so completing and encompassing, as I have said, the threeness in the Trinity, but articulating its oneness in the context of threeness. So consider closely what you are saying and see what you think. Be careful to offend neither Son nor Holy Spirit, lest you alienate both along with the Father." For he who sins against the Son also offends the Father, as the Son himself said, He that despiseth me despiseth him that sent me. Luke 10, 16. And again, He who honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father who hath sent him. John 5, 23. Surely he who would deny the Son this honor that the Holy Spirit proceeds from him just as from the Father does him none. Surely that man blasphemes greatly against the Holy Spirit when in his incorrect belief he separates the Spirit from communion with the Son in taking away the Son's role in the Spirit's procession. Therefore, such a man offends both the Son in judging him unworthy that the Holy Spirit should come from him, and the Spirit in judging him too unworthy to proceed from the Son, thus sinning grievously against both the Son and Spirit and also against the Father, such a man blasphemes the entire Trinity. What greater blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is there than to believe and to teach that the Holy Spirit does not proceed from the Son? Indeed it is written, Whoever shall speak, etc., against the Father or against the Son, etc. It shall be forgiven him, but he that speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world nor in the world to come. Matthew 12, 32. Not only does such a blasphemy seem to pertain to the Macedonian heresy, which said that the Holy Spirit is a creature and not 
God, but also we find it clearly written that such blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is in itself a sin. The man who commits this sin of blasphemy, infidelity, or impatience, unless he recovers his senses, will be forgiven neither in this age nor in the age to come, although that passage of Scripture can also be expounded in many other ways. Chapter 13 that no one should silently or patiently endure being called a blasphemer, for the Lord did not when it was said of him, You have a demon, that the Holy Spirit is given different names in his different actions. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, then said, You have constructed the question you propose with great thoughtfulness, but then you have added that we who deny that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son do injury to both the Spirit and Son. Rather, that we offend the whole trinity in this further, as you claim, we commit blasphemy. To this, neither could nor should we listen with equanimity, even though every sort of reproof calls for patience. This is another matter altogether, for who would patiently bear being called a blasphemer? The Lord, the model of complete patience, listened patiently to every hateful word addressed to him by the Jews when they called him a glutton and a drunkard and the son of a carpenter and many other such things. But when they finally said to him, Thou hast a devil, John 8, 48, and by Beelzebub, the prince of devils, he casts out devils, Matthew 9.34, he responded, I have not a devil, John 8.49. Thus he clearly taught that we should patiently endure every reproach against us, but that no one should be let pass in silence, that he be thought not a Catholic but a heretic, so a stranger to the Holy Spirit and the friend of devils. Therefore... I shall respond to what you have said as the Lord instructs me. That is, in no way do we offend the holy and undivided trinity, but like good Catholics, we truly venerate it in the unity of its substance with the honor due to its divinity. Nor do we divide it, cutting apart its divine substance as does Arius, or confuse its persons as does Sibelius, or separate the Holy Spirit from the deity by calling him as creatures as does Macedonius, nor do we blaspheme by attacking the Holy Spirit like the Phenomatic High. Indeed, we adore God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, three persons, one deity, undivided in glory, honor, power, and substance. Consider then whether we blaspheme the Holy Spirit thus. We believe that the Holy Spirit is to be adored with the Father and the Son, one God who through baptism defines and brings to life the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the intellect of Christ, the Spirit of the Lord, the Lord in Himself, the Spirit of filiation, of the Son of God Himself as our adoptive filiation, the Spirit of truth of liberation, of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and fortitude, of knowledge and piety, of fear of the Lord. For indeed, God the Holy Spirit affects all these things, filling all with substance, containing all things, replenishing the world and its substance, incomprehensible to the world in His power, good, righteous, and an origin. He sanctifies rather than is sanctified, vivifies rather than is brought to life, measures rather than is measured, offers participation rather than takes part, fills up rather than is filled, contains rather than is contained. He is our inheritance from Christ by the apostles. That spirit brings clarity and glorifies. He is numbered in the trinity of divine persons. He is the finger of God, fire of God, love, charity, the spirit who knows all, teaches who breathes where and how much he wills. He guides, speaks, was tempted in the desert, provoked when Jesus expelled the merchants and traders from the temple, and aroused the resurrection of Lazarus. He is the illuminator, vivifier, but still more light and life in himself. He creates a temple, deifies, accomplishes through faith his anticipation of baptism, seeks out baptism in the laying on of hands. He is God effecting whatsoever he affects, dividing through grace and tongues of fire, portioning out his charisms and creating apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and doctors. He is intellectual, manifest, great, immense, accessible, undefiled. He is co-equal in his influence, rise, and manifold in actions, manifesting all things under his own power, unalterable, 
omnipotent and panse epicus overseeing all things. He is the spirit surpassing all intellectual, pure, subtle, and angelic virtues as well as the prophetic and apostolic virtues, even other virtues otherwise elsewhere appropriately defined in which he manifests his boundlessness. But whatever we humbly say of the spirit that he is given, sent, shared, a charism, a gift, a breath, a promise, a mediation, or any other such description, we must refer all to their first cause so that we may demonstrate something from that. Since we hold and teach such things about the Holy Spirit, we are confident that we are not guilty of any unforgivable blasphemy. But do not be surprised if we have difficulty believing that he proceeds from the Son. However much argument you supply, we cannot accept it hastily, because no authority of the Gospel or of canonical scriptures or even of the Holy Councils persuades or teaches us so to believe. Chapter 14. That no one should align the meaning of that scripture we rightly call divine to his own understanding, but rather should accommodate his own understanding to the meaning of scripture. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, then said thus, If you demand authorities to persuade you of what I have set forth, would that when you hear them, you accept them with right understanding. But I am afraid that this common proverb applies to you, that is, a wolf was sat down to learn his letters, but not paying attention to what the teacher said, he kept repeating over and over what he bore in his heart, lamb, lamb, lamb. If you have hardened your heart and barred your obstinate mind, such that you will not acquiesce, no matter what, is said, then what point is there in my speaking? Is it better to keep humble silence than to speak uselessly, beating the air with idle words, for there is a time to speak and a time to keep silence? But if you wish to struggle, to twist around any authorities I set forth to your own interpretation, rather than troubling yourself to accommodate your understanding to divine scripture, I am afraid that perhaps in this too you may resist the Holy Spirit. You will be unembarrassed to twist to your reading even those texts dictated by the Holy Spirit, rashly distorting the Spirit's intent. Yet, we have come together, not to best one another in argument, but to search out what is true. As truth himself says thus, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, John 6, 64, and elsewhere, the spirit of life, Ezekiel 10, 17, who was in you, that is to say, the spirit of the Holy Scriptures, Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, responded thus, How wicked it would be to bend the meaning of that scripture we rightly call divine to fit one's own interpretation by a distorted exposition. Rather, we should humbly surrender, accommodating to our own understanding entirely to the meaning of divine scripture. This should be clear to anyone who is accustomed to devote time to sacred reading. So your warning is well taken, but now you too ought to do what you have cautioned me. If you wish to adduce sacred authorities, you should then expound them so that you seem not to force your interpretation to supporting your own opinion because it is yours, not because it is true, for it is written thus. He that strongly squeezeth the paps to bring out milk straineth out butter, and he that violently bloweth his nose bringeth out blood. Proverbs 30, 33. But now say what authorities support your views in the question before us. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, then spoke thus. Thus far it has been appropriate for each of us to press our opinions in our own words. But now that we begin to treat directly of holy texts, we should speak without contention, supporting one another with due respect, and giving honor to the Holy Spirit as the author of divine scripture, who reveals to us what he wishes to investigate in humility without contention. 
Some men prefer to continue to argue on even when they are defeated, to struggle against the truth with contentious words rather than to confess their own errors. Such men never discover what they should accept because they do not know how to keep humbly quiet. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, said thus, Well said, but this is not a matter to be passed over in silence, so that if one of us disagrees with the other in expounding scripture, his view should immediately be called wrong. He might sometimes disagree in good faith. One passage of scripture often elicits different and equally valid interpretations. By no means should these be spurned, even though they have small relevance to the present question. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, then answered, Excellently put. Now may you yourself remain obliging in this way and be generous and quick to trust. May you not seek, as is commonly said, a knot in a bulrush, for just as wisdom will not enter into a malicious soul, wisdom one four, so to divine wisdom will fill a well-disposed soul to overflowing. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, replied thus, Be so assured, for I believe freely what we must if I have been well persuaded. Now go on. Chapter 15 That the Lord breathed the Holy Spirit upon the apostles, yet that physical breath was not itself the Holy Spirit, but the sign of his procession and how one should understand the phrase, receive the Holy Ghost. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, said thus, After the resurrection, when the Lord Jesus showed himself to the disciples, he breathed on them, and he said to them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. John twenty twenty two. What else, I ask, did that breath signify, but that the Holy Spirit proceeds, and from the Lord himself. For that breath was not the very substance of the Holy Spirit, but the manifestation that the Holy Spirit proceeds also from the Son. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, responded thus, I aver that the bodily breath was not the substance of the Holy Spirit, but I do not agree that this breathing was the signification of his procession from the sun. Anselm, Bishop of Avelberg, answered thus, If, when Christ breathed out and said, Receive the Holy Spirit, the apostles received the Holy Spirit, then how could this breath not be held to be the signification of the Spirit's procession? And... If the Holy Spirit was given to the disciples in the Son's breath, when he said, Receive the Holy Spirit, tell me, I ask, how the Spirit came forth from the Son who gave him to the disciples who received him, except by proceeding from him who always is, and by coming forth to them, for whom he was then given as a gift. For, in order for the apostles to receive the Holy Spirit, the Lord had to give him, so that the Holy Spirit might proceed from the one giving into those receiving. For, his procession is eternal and in his substance. The Spirit who proceeds is no less eternal because those who receive him were not. Even if he was not then precisely said to have been given, he can still be called a gift or able to be given because he can be given or even if he was not in fact given, even if we do not say he was given unless in fact he were. Indeed, the Holy Spirit, in the natural essence proper to him, in which he is of the Father and the Son, is able to proceed or is given only by procession, nor is he given except by procession, nor is he received except by procession, nor does he effect anything 
except by procession. So when he is said to be sent, or to be given by either the Father or the Son, the Spirit is not said to be given in any other way than by procession. For their giving or sending him is his procession. Now, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son in two modes. The first is his eternal procession according to affect. The love the Father bears the Son and the Son bears the Father. And the second is his procession in time according to the effect of his gifts for men. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, then said thus, since the Holy Spirit is everywhere in his essence and is thus everywhere present, what do you think Christ gave those apostles by breathing upon them? Or what did the apostles receive when it was said to them thus, Receive the Holy Spirit? For if we say that they received the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, who is everywhere and who was already in their hearts, how can we properly say that they then received him, whom they already possessed as present already in their hearts? Anselm, Bishop of Avalberg, then replied thus, The Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and is the third person in the Trinity, the complete and perfect God, everywhere and never absent in his divine being, was himself already present in his divinity in the hearts of the apostles. Afterwards, however, he was also given to them humble and elect as they were, through indwelling grace. For he says about himself thus, But to whom shall I have respect, but to him who is poor and little, and of a contrite spirit, and that trembleth at my words? Isaiah 66, 2. And again, God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. James 4, 6. So they received the Holy Spirit as bearing fruit through his indwelling grace. That is, they received him who previously had been among them, but without bearing fruit, though everywhere in his divine essence. This was as if the Lord said thus, Receive in grace that Holy Spirit who was with you before only in essence. Receive as a gift him who was with you before as a stranger. Receive for your use and favor him who was with you before without your accepting his favor. Receive in the effect of his spiritual grace him who was with you until now only in his presence. Receive for your sanctification him who was with you before without the manifestation of his strength. So we might say to someone whose eyes were apparently clear but lacked sight thus, Receive eyes that you might see when before you could not. Or, as if this were said to someone with ears but deaf, receive now the hearing those ears which you had before without that power. Or to a mute with a tongue, receive a tongue with which to speak when before you were dumb. Or to a man with withered hands, receive hands for working which before yours could not do. Or to a cripple whose feet appear whole, receive feet for walking which before you could not. Or as if this were said to someone holding the money of another in trust, receive this money and take for your own use what you possessed but not for your own needs or for benefit. In this way the Lord seems to say, Receive that Holy Spirit, he who was with you before in the immensity of his divinity for your own use as a gift of spiritual grace. Before the Lord's solemn and manifest gift of the Holy Spirit, the apostles were inexperienced in spiritual grace. Therefore, the Lord said to Peter, when the apostle confessed Christ to the Son of God, thus, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, because flesh and blood hath not revealed it to thee, but my Father who is in heaven. Matthew sixteen seventeen. This is as if he had said, You have received this through a heavenly and divine inspiration, not by a human revelation in flesh and blood. To be sure, the other apostles had also divinely inspired faith before the gift of the Holy Spirit, but not enough to be saved by faith. But what they had, in a lesser degree, was now made complete through the solemn and manifest gift of the Holy Spirit. Is this not right? Is this not the case for Peter, prince of the apostles, who, when he was with Christ, said that he was ready to go both to prison and to death? 
but immediately denied him at the sound of the portress's voice. The same Peter nevertheless was clothed in virtue from on high after the gift of the Holy Spirit. He responded confidently to the chief priests when they threatened him thus, We ought to obey God rather than men. Acts 5.29 Indeed, this gift of the Holy Spirit happened first on earth through the Lord's breath for the sake of love of neighbor, and afterwards it occurred from heaven in the many tongues for the sake of love of God. That the Holy Spirit was given twice instructs us that we should have believed him to proceed from two persons at the same time, and not in two processions, but in one. He was given from heaven as from the Father who is in heaven, and on earth as from the Son who dwelled with men on earth in his humanity. Although, when the Son gave the Spirit, he was not then on earth as a mortal amongst mortals, for after his resurrection and before his ascension he was pleased to reveal himself to the apostles and then to grant the Holy Spirit to them abundantly. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, responded thus, Since we speak of the loftiest theology, comparisons to bodily things should have no place, for we should not compare higher to lower things. The enduring nature of what does not change cannot be fully known from the instability of what does. Indeed, what is comparing spiritual things to the corporeal or adapting the divine to the human other than looking for the living among the dead? Chapter 16. That spiritual things are sometimes compared to the corporeal and sometimes corporeal to spiritual. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, then spoke. I acknowledge what you say, for no metaphor fully expresses the exact precise truth of the thing it figures. An image is never a whole, but only a part. Otherwise, it would be the thing itself rather than its image. Nor is any image entirely like what it represents, even among corporeal things, when they are compared to one another figuratively. Thus we interpret images of this sort as if they were theatrical, certainly not as expressing the pure truth of what they represent, but as raising the mind of the viewer to a better understanding. So, we often come to know through this kind of instruction, something we did not heretofore understand because of its lofty nature, as the mind rises through the familiar things it knows to the unfamiliar things it does not yet recognize. For the invisible things of him are clearly seen being understood through the things that are made. Romans 1.20 Many of the passages make this point. And just as spiritual things are often understood through images of corporeal things, so, too, sometimes corporeal things are learned through spiritual things. As God said to Moses, Look and make, etc., it according to the pattern that was shewn thee in the mount. Exodus 25.40 There God clearly commanded that Moses physically arrange everything for the construction of the tabernacle according to the image of those things he had seen in a spiritual vision on the mountain. Then... We ought never scorn the theoretical aspect of corporeal things or the physical images of incorporeal things, even if these images are unable to express the truth of their reference to perfection. Most of the time, words are inwardly formed invisibly through visible things known to the intellect in the invisible soul of one whose understanding is incomplete. In a similar manner, visible strokes of letters are formed visibly on a visible sheet of parchment, then speak by being silent, and are silent even as they speak. Yet, through those same visible strokes, the soul of a reader frames an invisible understanding. He retrieves the words when he looks back at the same letters after forgetfulness has removed them from the understanding in which they were first written. So visible letters and new invisible understandings come about in the image of spoken words, even if those visible and invisible things connote not each other but divine nature. The Lord himself spoke through images in parables, now comparing the corporeal to the spiritual, now the spiritual to the corporeal. But I do not think we can find any utterly clear likeness of creature to creator. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, responded thus, 
I concur in what you have said about these matters, but now if you have any authoritative text on the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Son, set them forth. Chapter 17 That when the woman touched the hem of the Lord's garment, power went forth from him. And we call that power the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from him. Anselm, Bishop of Avelberg, answered thus, Hear and attend to what the Son said about the woman who suffered from a hemorrhage and who was healed upon touching the hem of his garment thus. Somebody hath touched me, for I know that virtue has gone forth from me. Luke 8, 46. We call this virtue or power the Holy Spirit, as we know from that passage where the angel instructs Mary, saying to her thus, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. Luke 1.35 For when the angel had fittingly announced, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, he added, And the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. He did so to show that the Holy Spirit is the same as the power of the Most High. So the Lord himself promised the Spirit to the disciples, saying, But stay you in the city till you be endued with the power from on high. Luke 24:49. And again he said, You shall receive the power of the Holy Ghost coming upon you, and you shall be witness unto me. Acts 1, 8. As we believe, the evangelist says of this power, virtue went forth from him and healed all. Luke 6.19 Therefore, the Holy Spirit evidently proceeds also from the Son, unless you wish to close your eyes in order not to see what is clearer in the light, and not to hear Scripture crying out, forcing itself upon you, although you try to be deaf to it. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, then replied, if the Holy Spirit, as you assert, therefore proceeds from the Father and the Son, why did the Son speak of the Spirit who proceedeth from the Father? John fifteen twenty six. But say nothing regarding the Spirit's procession from himself. Anselm, Bishop of Avelberg, countered thus. Why, indeed, except that he often refers what is his to the Father, from whom he himself also is. Thus the Son also says, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. John 7.16 If we thus understand his teaching to be, as he says, not his own, but his Father's, should we not still more understand the Holy Spirit to proceed from him in the passage where he says, He proceedeth from the Father? Then the Son would not say, He does not proceed from me, for he knows from the Father that he is God, for he is God from God, and the Holy Spirit certainly knows from the Father that he proceeds from him. Through the same Father, the Holy Spirit knows too that he also proceeds from the Son, just as he knows from the Father himself that he proceeds from the Father. These things are clearly implied in the Gospel when the Lord says thus, Whom I will send you from the Father. John 15, 26, showing that the Holy Spirit is of both the Father and the Son. When the Son said, Whom the Father will send, he added in my name. John 14, 26, yet he did not say, Whom the Father will send from me, but whom I will send you from the Father. He was clearly showing that the Father the author of both generation and procession, is the origin of all divinity, or perhaps it would be better to say of all deity. Therefore, we rightly refer him to... Therefore, we rightly refer him who proceeds from the Father and the Son to him of whom the Son was born. So, the Holy Spirit is the power of the Most High, that is, the Father, and he is also the power of the Son, who is himself the Most High. Since the Spirit is the power of both, we correctly believe him also to proceed from both. For just as their communion is not of one but of both, so too his procession is not from one but from both. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, then said, we believe that the Holy Spirit is of both Father and Son, for indeed we recognize that the Lord himself said, For it is not you that speak, but the Spirit of your Father that speaketh in you. 
Matthew 10, 20. We also know that the apostle says, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, Romans 8, 11. Here he surely means the spirit of the father. Again, the apostle says thus, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Galatians 4, 6. And in another place, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his, Romans 8, 9. And so on, account of these and many other such testimonies in which we have been instructed, we well believe, as I have said, that the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, is of the Father and of the Son. Yet we are not so bold as to confess that he proceeds from both, because perhaps it is one thing to have being of the Father and another to proceed from Him. Chapter 18 That just as being for the Holy Spirit comes from the Father in His procession from the Father, so too His being comes from the Son in His procession from the Son. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, then said thus, The Holy Spirit, who is of the Father, and who proceeds from the Father, either is of the Father in his procession from the Father, or is not of the Father in his procession from the Father. For if he proceeds from the Father in being of the Father, why does he not similarly proceed from the Son in being of the Son? He is of the Father as he is also of the Son, and he is of the Son as he is also of the Father. And so his being is of both the Father and Son, unless perhaps we venture to say that he has one being from the Father and another from the Son, which is utter madness. He does not have one being from the Father and another from the Son, nor does he have one procession from the Father and another from the Son. Rather, he has one and the same being and one and the same procession, as much as from the Father as from the Son. He neither exists nor proceeds twice, nor is he two, nor does he have two processions, nor even, as would be impious to say, do two Holy Spirits proceed. Just as is certain that the Spirit's being of the Father is nothing other than his procession from the Father, so too undoubtedly his being of the Son is nothing other than his procession from the Son, for his procession is in substance. But... If you posit that it is one thing for the Spirit to be of the Father and another for him to proceed from the Father, then you at once make him different from himself, whose existence of the Father is nothing other than his procession from the Father. The Spirit then exists by procession from the Father, and he proceeds from the Father by existing in procession in substance, and in a substance that can and does proceed. Then show, if you can that the Holy Spirit has been otherwise from the Son, and show, if you can, that his being from the Father and the Son is one thing and his procession another. If then you have thus rendered him different from himself, you have rashly voided sound faith about the Holy Spirit. Again, if it is the same thing for the Spirit to exist of the Father as for him to proceed from the Father, and if he has the same being of the Father and of the Son, then he proceeds from the Son just as from the Father. But if he does not proceed from the Son, then his being of the Son is not the same as his being of the Father. And if his being of the Son is not the same as his being of the Father, then either he has other being of the Son or no being whatsoever of the Son. Yet... Either of these possibilities rings false. If the Spirit is not of the Son, neither is he of the Father, for the Father and the Son are one. If he is not of the Father, neither does he proceed from the Father. Again, because the Spirit is able to proceed from the Father, he does indeed proceed from the Father for the same reason because he is able to proceed from the Son. The Spirit also proceeds from the Son. 4. It is as great, or rather the same, for the Holy Spirit to be of the Father, and of the Son, as to proceed from the Father and from the Son. Thus is written about the Spirit. For he shall not speak of himself, but what things soever he shall hear, he shall speak. John sixteen thirteen. Whence he will hear, thence he will speak, and whence he will speak, thence he proceeds. 
whence his being, thence his hearing, whence his hearing, thence his knowledge, whence his knowledge, thence his procession. So too, since the spirit is since the spirit's being is of both father and son, his procession in existing, hearing and knowing is from both as well. Therefore, we speak of the Son's being of the Father as birth from the Father and the Holy Spirit's being of the Father and the Son, not as birth, but as procession. The difference between being by birth and being by procession is difficult to discern, yet we say that also the Son himself proceeds from the Father, as where Scripture says, I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. John 16, 13. And again, from God I proceeded, John 8, 42. Nevertheless, the procession of the Son is a different procession from that of the Holy Spirit. For the Son is sent with his own mission and procession in his birth, and in birth he proceeds from the Father, while the Holy Spirit proceeds with his own mission and procession in his very procession. In the Spirit's procession, he is sent as much from the Son as from the Father. Therefore, attend to what you say, being careful not to deny the Holy Spirit's procession from the Son, so that you also be convinced to deny the Spirit, the being he has from the Son. Since the Holy Spirit's existence and procession are the same, whoever denies that he proceeds from the Son also denies that he exists of the Son. And whoever denies that he exists of the Son also denies that he exists of the Father, for they are surely one. Further, Whoever denies the Spirit exists, or that he proceeds, as much from the Son as from the Father, denies that the Holy Spirit exists. Consequently, to say either of these things is to dissolve the entire Trinity. See how perverse and impious that would be. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, then said thus, I must respond first, I think, that in substance the Son and Holy Spirit are the same as the Father, but for the Son to be begotten or for the Holy Spirit to proceed is not the same as for the Father to beget. Just as you said a little while ago, however, to define either how the Father begets or how the Son is begotten or how the Holy Spirit proceeds is neither easy to investigate nor possible to state. Nevertheless... We can say advisedly that the one begets in one way, the other is begotten in another way, and the third proceeds in still another way, yet by no means should we impute to them any activity or passivity in these matters. Although the being of the Father is the same in substance as that of the Son and the Holy Spirit, nevertheless, one being alone is the Father in his person, not the Son or the Holy Spirit. Another being alone is the Son in his person, not the Father or the Holy Spirit. And the third being alone is the Holy Spirit in his person, not the Father or the Son. For the former usage, being in substance, denotes the identity of the same substance in the three. But the latter, being in person, indicates the distinction of persons among the same three. Consequently, when you investigate my logical argument whether the Holy Spirit has the same being from both the Father and the Son, and again when you inquire whether his existence and procession are the same, thus striving to prove that his existence from both is the same as his procession from both, when you do this, as I assert, you should undoubtedly pay careful attention. Although the Holy Spirit may pertain to both and be of both, Still, he does not seem to exist and proceed equally from both. Certainly, he is of the Father, as of that Father, who is himself of nothing else. The Father, who is himself of nothing else, nonetheless has that Holy Spirit, who takes his being from the same Father. But at the same time, the Spirit is of the Son, as of the one who is himself of the Father, who has from the Father that the Holy Spirit is also his own and takes his being from him as Son. So it seems that the Holy Spirit truly is of both and from both, but that Spirit does not seem to be equally of both or proceed equally from both. Chapter 19. 
whether the Holy Spirit proceeds equally from Father and Son, given that the Father has his being from no other, but the Son has his being from the Father, and a figurative interpretation of the first made man, Adam, the separation of the first made woman, Eve, and their progeny, Abel. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, then spoke thus, That Father, who is of no other, has nothing from the Son or from the Holy Spirit. Neither does the Son, who is from the Father, have anything from the Holy Spirit, but the Son has everything, even his very being, as God from the Father, for he is God from God. The Son has as well from the Father that the Holy Spirit proceeds also from him. Further, the Holy Spirit has from the same Father that he proceeds from the Son, just as he proceeds from the Father. Thus, Anything that is the Son, or anything the Son has, and anything that is the Holy Spirit, all of these take their beginning from the Father himself. He is the Father, author, and origin of generation and procession from no other. He has nothing from any other. Perhaps thence we might think that the Holy Spirit does not belong equally to both, Father and Son, or proceed equally from both. But what then? We undertook this discussion not about how the Holy Spirit might proceed from both, but about whether he proceeds from both. As soon as we have established that, then if it is agreeable, we may examine the question of how he proceeds. But I wish you to turn briefly to the latter question, how he proceeds, if you will. For I say that by no means does equality of existence and of procession from both detract from the Holy Spirit, because the very Father, from whom he exists and proceeds, is himself from no other, and indeed the other from whom the Spirit likewise exists and proceeds, namely the Son, is himself of the Father. For the Spirit exists or proceeds neither earlier nor later, neither more nor less on account of one or the other. He proceeds eternally, at the same time, once and for all, from both, not in unequal measure, but equally, that is, in that equality we acknowledge. Nevertheless, some might say that he exists and proceeds more properly from the Father, as from a first cause, than from the Son, whose cause the Father is. Yet, although we say that the Father is of no other, and the Son is of the Father, We should by no means understand priority or succession in this. No greater stature in one and lesser in the other person, but rather equality of majesty in the two. Even though the Father has no cause, and the Son has the Father as his cause, the same power and glory in here in the one caused in the one with no cause. As I have said, that is, for the one having a cause and the one not having a cause. How could they who are of the same eternity, majesty, power, capacity, will, and equality send forth that Holy Spirit as proceeding from them unequally rather than equally? The procession of the Holy Spirit in his substance just as the beginning of the Son is in his substance. We can understand this through a figurative reading. Adam was the creature of God alone without any other generative cause. Eve was then created from Adam, divided off from him, as her preceding cause, and Abel descended from them both neither by a new creation nor by dividing off from a creature, but by the effluence of natural human generation. Adam was human, Eve was human, Abel was human, and so they were homoousion, that is, alike in substance or of the same nature. But the one who was Adam was neither Eve nor Abel. The one who was Eve was neither Adam nor Abel. And the one who was Abel was neither Adam nor Eve. Or do you not think that Abel was begotten as much from his father Adam, who has his cause, since nothing else was begot him or divided him off, as from his mother Eve, who was brought into being not by being begotten, but by separation from Adam himself as her cause? Just as Adam and Eve together generated Abel, so to Abel himself was truly begotten equally from them both. Although we discern difference between those begetting him, that is, between a creature and one divided off from that creature, still Abel is not different from his parents, rather, like them, having been so begotten. Nor is Adam prior to the mother Eve in being Abel's father, 
but the two are father and mother at the same moment, and Abel is again at once their son, descending from each by equal effluence of their generation of him. Eve's existence, by separation from Adam, does not prevent Abel from being the son of one as much as the other, the son neither more nor less of the one than of the other. Indeed, Eve's role is to be from Adam by separation, and Abel's role as the son of Adam is also to be the son of Eve in her giving birth to him. Eve takes her motherhood of Abel, whom she bore, from Adam, who is himself the father of Abel, whom he begot. We should look upon this figure I have set forth as if it were a dramatic scene. So no one would say that the Holy Spirit existed one way in proceeding from the Father and in another way in proceeding from the Son. Even though the Father from whom he takes his being and from whom that Spirit proceeds is the very Father who is of no other, while the Son from whom the Spirit similarly takes his being and proceeds is of the Father. Just as we argued before, the Holy Spirit takes the same being from each, and that same being is to proceed just as truly and as ineffably from each. To believe this is both necessary to the faith and essential for salvation. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, responded thus. As you have constructed your argument that the Holy Spirit as the same being of the Father and of the Son does not seem absurd, but you have not demonstrated whether he proceeds equally or unequally from each of the two. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, then said, Since you concede that the Spirit's being is the same from each of the other persons, you must also admit that the Spirit's being proceeds from each, for we clearly demonstrated already that for him to have the same being from each is to proceed from each, and to have the same procession from each is to take his being from each. Consequently, just as the Spirit is of the Father, so he is of the Son, nor is he of the Father in one way and the Son in another. Now, the Spirit is of the Father by proceeding from Him, and meanwhile He takes His being as much from the Son as from the Father, and the Spirit's being is nothing other than His procession from each. But now listen closely. You concede that the Holy Spirit is sent by the Son, and I know you concede this because we clearly read this in the Gospel, unless some impiety has stricken it from your copies of Scripture, as I doubt, that, as the Son says, whom I will send you, John 15, 26. You also concede that the Spirit receives and announces what is from the same Son, whose being he shares. For this is also in the Gospel, unless, as I have said, it is erased in the copies of the Greeks. He shall receive of mine, it says, and show it to you, John sixteen fifteen. For he shall not speak of himself, but what things soever he shall hear, he shall speak. John 15, 13. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, then said, I indeed concede all these things, that the Spirit is of the Son, that he is sent from the Son, that he receives and announces what is of the Son, that the Spirit hears from the Son, and that he speaks on the Son's authority. All this that the Gospel teaches I concede, but I neither teach nor presume to teach that the Spirit proceeds from the Son, for the Gospel does not teach it. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, replied thus, I marvel at your scrupulousness, that you should so abhor this word proceed, regarding the Holy Spirit in relation to the Son, when the Gospel presents an equivalent term, and this exact meaning, and you are confident in agreeing with the gospel, for what else is the Spirit's being sent forth from the Son, or what else could it be than his procession from the Son? If indeed the Son sends the Spirit forth, then it follows that the Spirit so sent proceeds from the Son who sends him. Nevertheless, the Spirit as sent is not then absent from the Son who sent him, nor is he separated from the Son. Rather, the Spirit is always present to the Son, who is in turn always present to the Spirit. Again, 
The Spirit is of the Son, who also takes all his being from the Father. So that Spirit is of the Son, and likewise has from the Father what he has from the Son. How could we imagine that Spirit not to proceed from the Son when, as we have just said again and again, his procession is nothing other than his being, and his being is nothing other than his procession. While his hearing and his speaking are nothing other than his being and his procession, and all of this not of himself. For the Spirit exists in his procession and proceeds by being, for his being is in being able to proceed. We therefore conclude, without doubt from all that we have said, that the Holy Spirit is of the Father, He is also of the Son, He is from the Father, and He is from the Son. He is sent by the Father, and He is sent by the Son, and He proceeds from the Son just as He proceeds from the Father. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, replied thus, I cannot deny that you seem to have demonstrated what you proposed by careful arguments and appropriate authorities. As for me, I would not wish to oppose the Holy Spirit, but still I want you to hear what utterly confounds and terrifies about this word procession. Our Lord Jesus Christ, Savior of the human race, founder of the faith, author of the gospel, lover of our salvation, taught the apostles a faith sufficient for their salvation. He would not suffice as Savior unless he had sufficed as teacher. But never did the Lord Jesus speak about the Holy Spirit's procession from the Son as he did about the Spirit's procession from the Father. Hence it seems to me wildly rash to presume to add or subtract anything from that Christian faith already established and sufficient from salvation, especially regarding faith in Holy Trinity. And it seems to me, in offering due reverence to the gospel, we should use the word procession precisely as it is ascribed to the Holy Spirit in his procession from the Father. By no means should we say that procession from the Son is ascribed to the Holy Spirit. Thus we may walk safely in faith, adding nothing, subtracting nothing, but simply holding what we have been taught from the gospel, just as it is unsafe to subtract anything, so too it is dangerous to add anything to that faith. Chapter 20. That while we do not find in the gospel that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son, we do not find that the Spirit does not proceed from the Son, nor that he proceeds from the Father alone. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, then said, you have spoken as befits the maturity and prudence of so great a man as you. Nevertheless, we should not fear when there is no cause for alarm. Now stay and listen carefully to what I say. If you are afraid to say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son because the phrase proceeds from the Son is not written anywhere in the Gospel, tell me, I ask, what boldness or foolishness leads you not to fear to say the opposite regarding his procession, that he does not proceed from the Son, when we also find that written nowhere in Scripture, even in the Gospel? Why are you not silent, whereas you think the Gospel is silent? Where do you get that not, that negation, that the Gospel does not teach you? Who could ever persuade you to say he does not proceed from the Son when the gospel does not say this, yet the gospel could not persuade you to say he proceeds from the Son when it neither denies nor prohibits this assertion. You respect the gospel so much that you would not dare to say he proceeds from the Son, and yet you do not respect the gospel enough that you would not say he does not proceed from the Son. You are afraid where we should not fear, and you are not afraid where we should be. I admit to you that the expression proceeds from the Son cannot be found anywhere in Scripture, so simply put. And you must also admit that the expression does not proceed from the Son is nowhere found there either. What then? Shall we argue about terms that mean one thing here and another thing there? Should we wrangle over letters or syllables or expressions and leave behind the truth of the matter? Let us rather leave games of grammar and dialectic to children, instead delving into the meaning and hearing the words. 
You say then that the Holy Spirit proceeds either from the Father alone or not from Him alone. If you were to say the Spirit proceeds from the Father alone, then you certainly did not get this from the Gospel. But if you might choose to say the Spirit does not proceed from the Father alone, then you would be saying that He proceeds from the Son even as from the Father. Else you would be acknowledging that you do not know whence He proceeds. But perhaps you would dare choose neither, since neither is found articulated in that Gospel to which you suppose absolutely nothing must be added. Therefore, we may say in clear faith, contradicting neither the Gospel nor yourself, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and from the Son. For since the Gospel says that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and not from the Father alone, it clearly allows us to say that He proceeds not only from the Father but also from the Son. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, replied thus, In saying that the Spirit proceeds from the Son, and that He proceeds not only from the Father, you force me to say that He proceeds from the Father alone. Then you force me to deny rashly what the Gospel does not say, but you yourself seem to assert similarly rashly something outside of it. These words pertain to the one speaking no more than to the one so forced to speak. Chapter 21 that nothing should be asserted rashly or refuted angrily. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, responded thus, This was the platonic way of teaching in the schools of the academics, that is, to assert without rashness and to refute without anger. Reason is sometimes deceptive, for it sometimes is deceived by the likeness of truth. But honest reason embraces truth with certain knowledge. When reason misleads, we rightly refute it without anger. So, too, when it is honest, we defend it without proud rashness, with modest assertion, and praiseworthy humility. You should then reprove your own rashness, not mine, because I hold this procession of the Holy Spirit from the Son, of which we have treated as demonstrated by many witnesses of the Gospel and of other scriptures. I neither add it rashly, nor with misleading argument to the faith. I believe it faithfully, but you know of nothing, nor could you, to the contrary, in the gospel and the other scriptures. So you should reprove your own rashness in denying what neither the gospel nor any of the other scriptures denies. You rashly seek to disprove what we must demonstrate and ignore what we must disprove. But my faith, as I assert and know it, is blameless. I argue for this faith without rashness, in the testimony of the Scriptures, and with the assistance of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I am not rash in adding what is certain. Rather, I believe it faithfully, and I truthfully demonstrate what we must believe. But likewise, you must refute what seems dubious to you without anger. Therefore, confess with me that the Holy Spirit proceeds also from the Son. If you do not yet dare to do so, Perhaps because you are too weak-spirited, you are anxious when there is nothing to fear. So at least do this thus. Keep your silence as I confess it. Do not deny what leaves you uncertain. What I affirm with solid certainty, with the impudent monosyllable of negation, not. But if you want to respond, respond thus. That you are entirely ignorant as to whether the Spirit does or does not proceed from the Son. Then you will have responded rightly, that is, by confessing your ignorance, and meanwhile not denying my faith. For how can anyone properly judge what he does not know? And you cannot deny your ignorance about this. Stop judging this matter, presuming to deny what you heretofore held only to be uncertain, and what you rashly then denied even though you were ignorant on the matter. Indeed, it is not fitting for one who wanders off the path without knowing he is lost to try to correct another wisely following the correct way. Likewise, it is incongruous for the one whose faith is clear to imply doubt, unless, perhaps, that false opinion of the academics still remains with you or with some of your fellows, by which they considered the highest wisdom to be endlessly argued ignorance of all things." For that reason, they are called masters of ignorance, since they responded every question with, What if you are mistaken? Aristotle, one of their sages, therefore says, To doubt everything will be useful. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, then said thus, 
The Greek sages never said that opinion should be taken for truth. Rather, they chose humbly to express doubt concerning ambiguities about faith rather than rashly to frame definitions. Since we must hand over to the fire of the Holy Spirit matters of which Scripture says only little, or when the human intellect fails to comprehend them, we are men and our human temptation is to understand something otherwise than as it is. To perform the sacrilege of breaking communion, to begin a schism, or to partake of heresy for love of one's own opinion or for envy of one's betters, this is diabolical presumption. But it is angelic perfection to understand in nothing something other than what it is. Therefore, since we are men, so often deceived and mistaken, let us beware of diabolical presumption until we reach the perfection of angelic thought. For this reason, then, our fathers humbly shunned affirmation of this procession with the phrase, He proceeds from the Son, because they did not know the truth of the matter and guarded against rash expression. Nor did they ever adopt the negative statement, He does not proceed from the Son, because they feared error and so avoided offense against Scripture by stating neither case directly, unless occasionally they were provoked by the impudent rash assertions of Latins, who came to us arrogantly vaunting their loftiness of speech and beating the air with noisy disputations. Such foreigners wished to display their smattering of knowledge, trying in their pride to obfuscate, even to smother the great wisdom of the Greeks in clouds of sophistry. But we did not yield to them, rather sent them back defeated, as they should have been. Now, however, we freely attend to your mildness, beloved servant of God, because you speak this word that can save our souls humbly and meekly, likewise listening humbly to us. So you maintain reason and attention to authoritative texts rather than contention. Truly, what we have offered you here, a public assembly in the royal city, has heretofore never been granted any earlier Latin. To any of those extolling himself in opposition to true knowledge of God, but let us go on. How is it that the first council of Nicaea, where 318 fathers took part, did not treat of the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Son? Clearly, the creed composed in that council and confirmed by the authority of so many fathers contains nothing of this sort. But what it does contain is locked within the key of anathema, so that nothing can be added, nothing taken away, without the greatest scandal to the church and danger to the soul. How, then, do you think that you will escape that anathema when you do not shrink from introducing the Holy Spirit's possession from the Son, where it was not said before from adding it to the faith? If you hold that the Council of Nicaea is worthy of respect for all Catholics. Chapter 22 that we would not be rash to add something to the gospel if it does not contradict the gospel, just as was done at the Council of Nicaea and at many other councils. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, then said thus, I embrace the creed of the Council of Nicaea with due veneration, and, as a Catholic, I embrace the twenty-two chapters of the same council that come down to us in written exemplars. But when I assert the Holy Spirit's procession from the Son, a belief the Nicene documents do not prohibit, I neither teach nor add anything contrary to the creed so that I should dread its anathema. That council's statutes prohibit that we add anything contrary to its creed under the threat of anathema. But they do not forbid that we add anything at all, nor do they forbid that we teach nothing, nor is it the case that for we indeed permit the teaching of other things. You are a learned reader of the gospel, and as you asserted before, the faith established by the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel, the evangelical faith that only a sham defender would either add to or diminish, is sufficient for the salvation of the faithful. Since you do not wish to add or erase or even to change one stroke or letter or to explain the sense of evangelical scripture with other words meaning the very same thing, tell me then, how could you ever be persuaded to accept the Council of Nicaea or any other council when so many things necessary to the Christian faith were established in nearly all the general councils, though they were nowhere in the gospel? Tell me further. 
If you are not willing to accept the Holy Spirit's procession from the Son for the sole reason that you do not want to seem to add anything to the gospel not explicitly contained in it, why do you therefore not reject the faith of the Council of Nicaea as approved and accepted by the Universal Church when that same faith is certainly never found so clearly and openly set forth in the gospel? Do you believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Did you adore the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as one God in substance, three in persons? Do you believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as the Holy Trinity, one almighty God, a deity, whole in essence and substance, in the co-eternal and omnipotent trinity of one will, power, and majesty, creator of all creatures? Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, answered thus, I believe, for I am a Christian, not an Arian, Anselm, Bishop of Avalberg, then said thus, Do you believe that each of the persons of the Holy Trinity is the one true God, complete and perfect? Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, replied thus, I do so believe because I am Catholic, not Sibylian, and this is the correct faith of believers. We neither divide the substance in God, as do the Arians, nor do we confuse his persons, as do the Sibylians. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, returned. Do not become angry, I beg you in brotherhood. Do not be offended if I question you a bit further, since I ask not so that I might watch you like a spy, ambushing you in your response, but so that I learn something from you, or perhaps you learn something from me. Then we might pardon one another and come to know each other's faith. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, responded, Ask freely what you will, I welcome it. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, then spoke. Do you believe that the Son of God is the Word of God, eternal, born of the Father, consubstantial, omnipotent, and equal to the Father's divinity in all ways, born in time of the Holy Spirit and the ever-Virgin Mary and having a rational soul? Do you believe that he had two births, an eternal birth from the Father and a temporal birth from his mother, that he was true God and true man, proper and perfect in each of his natures, not adopted, not as an image only, the one and only Son of God in and from two natures, yet a one in person, impassable and immortal in his divinity, but in his humanity, experiencing the true suffering of the flesh for us and for our salvation? Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, answered thus, I believe and I embrace all these things because our Holy Mother Church so decreed in response to the heretical Nestorian belief that there are two persons in Christ and after the heretical Eutychian belief that there is one nature in Christ and after very many other errors set aside consciously and clearly in your language thus far in our discussion. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, then said, do you also believe the Holy Spirit is true God, whole and perfect, co-equal and co-essential with the Father and the Son, omnipotent and co-eternal through all things? Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, responded, What you have said is indeed the Catholic faith, confirmed after the Macedonian heresy and strengthened at the Council of Alexandria by many Orthodox fathers, treating of the divinity of the Holy Spirit, understanding him in the consubstantial trinity. Whoever does not hold this faith in its entirety reveals himself an unfaithful Christian. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, said thus, You believe well, you worship well, and you speak well. Tell me then, dear brother, for the sake of the charity we share, where in the gospel is this faith of yours found so clearly set forth? The gospel teaches there clearly that we believe in God the Father and God the Son when the Son says, You believe in God, believe also in me. John 14, 1. You believe in the Holy Spirit, and you believe in him rightly, but nowhere in the gospel, to my knowledge, is this belief expressed clearly and simply in words. Nevertheless, Scripture directly proclaims the Holy Spirit to be God, where the Apostle says, Know you not that you are the temple of God? And immediately adds thus, And that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you, 1 Corinthians 3.16. For God dwells in his temple, but the Spirit of God does not dwell in the temple of God as a minister, as in another place. Or know you not that your members are the temple of the Holy Ghost, who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? 
For you have been bought at a great price. Glorify, etc., God in your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. And again, the temple of God is holy, which you are. 1 Corinthians 3, 17. You rightly worship God the Father because the gospel teaches this. True adorers shall adore the Father in spirit and in truth. John 4, 23. You also rightly worship God the Son because you believe in Him as God and you worship Him correctly as God. The Gospel suggests this. I and the Father are one, etc. The Father is in me and I in the Father. John 10, 30-38. For since the Father and Son are truly one God, each in the other and consubstantial, not one in person, as I have said, then we must rightly adore the one God in each as in the other. But that we worship the Spirit as one to be adored and glorified together with the Father and the Son, where, I ask, is this ever clearly and distinctly set forth in the gospel? Yet any careful reader, if he diligently consider the verse, true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, finds there immediately that we must worship the whole Trinity, I think, for when the Scripture says, true adorers shall adore the Father, it immediately considers in spirit and again in truth, evidently meaning that we must worship the Father in the Spirit and in the truth, that is, in the Son. And we must worship the Son in the Father and the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit in the Father and in the Son. But the heretics, passing over the text of the Gospel carelessly and without restraint, foolishly wandering through it without examining the Spirit and life hidden in the evangelical words, utterly failed to assert that the Holy Spirit should be worshipped. Nor did they with decent care examine the gospel writings that show clearly whether the Spirit should be worshipped or not. See how your argument holds up in which you claim that you so revere the gospel that you would not dare to add anything to the faith you had to be sufficiently, you hold to be sufficiently established in it. Yet, in this, you demonstrably contradict yourself, in that first you certainly felt and said that nothing should be added to the faith of the Gospels, but afterwards, in Christian confession, you affirmed the faith of the Holy Trinity as defined, handed down, and strengthened against heresies by the Council of Nicaea and the other councils. Chapter 23. That faith in the Holy Trinity was fully founded in the councils presided over by the Holy Spirit as Pantopiscos, that is, the bishop over all, first author and founder of the gospel. Nevertheless, you would not further so restrict the faith of the gospel that the creed of the Nicene Council, even the other councils of the Orthodox Fathers, at which the Holy Spirit, whom you only a little while ago called Pantopiscos, bishop of all, presided as author, might seem superfluous. The Catholic faith was so strengthened and confirmed in these councils that if they had not been celebrated, the very faith that we hold, whereby we profess and believe in unity, in trinity, and trinity in unity would not exist today, or if it did, would toil and waver under innumerable heresies. Since the Lord was aware of how many things would have to be added for the establishment of the Catholic faith after he had told his disciples everything that was appropriate for that time, he added, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot hear them now. But when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will teach you all truth. John 16, 12 through 13. You remember in your brotherhood what the Lord says in the gospel about himself. I am the way and the truth and the life. John 14, 6. But he also says this, When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will teach you all truth. John 16, 13. Behold, the Holy Spirit is the affection of the Father and the Son, the binding together of both the charity of both the Spirit, I say, of the Son who is truth, the Spirit of truth teaching all the truth. Proceeding from the Son who is truth, the Spirit framed the gospel and established a faith suitable to the apostles living in our own time. Behold, the Spirit was promised by the Son when he affirmed that he still had much to say, but in good time. And what do you think the same Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, taught, except what he knew the Son, that truth from whom he proceeded, still had to say? Certainly the Spirit himself taught nothing other than what the Son said he had yet to say. Because the Holy Spirit proceeds from the mouth of truth, who is Christ, that Spirit first framed the gospel and afterwards he took part in the counsels of the Holy Fathers as author and teacher of the truth, as the Son had promised. 
in the Council of the Holy Fathers. He explained the faith that he had founded more concisely in the Gospel. Proceeding from the Son, he made known truthfully and taught more completely what the Son still had to say. Then the whole church, spread all over the world, could at once sustain what before the apostles alone were unable to bear. So, as I have said, the Holy Spirit took part in the councils of the Holy Fathers, coming as promised to teach the whole truth to them, now and always, presiding there as the teacher of all, elucidating faith in the Holy Trinity, such as we hold between the impieties of Arius' division of the divine substance and Sibelius' confusion of the persons. He communicated the whole truth little by little. He instituted the ecclesiastical sacraments, established as well ordered the form of baptism that the Lord had instituted, and put in order the rite the Holy Church maintained for the consecration of the body and blood of the Lord. He set up patriarchs, metropolitans, archbishops, bishops, priests, deacons, and the other lesser ecclesiastical orders of divine ministry appropriate to the house of God. He defined unction with holy oil and the sacrament of penance, as well as the imposition of hands for holy orders. He appointed solemn masses and other divine offices for the praise of God. Through the agency of Catholic doctors, he revealed for us the sacred scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as one raining on them from without, and one watering from within. He made himself known by suggesting to us, through his interior inspiration, those secret and divine things mysteriously hidden by the seal of the divine scriptures. With his power, as Most High, he powerfully demolished the heresies that crept in little by little, and through apostolic men he proclaimed ecclesiastical laws for the preservation of the Christian religion. In sum, he illuminated the entire church. He had so instructed in holy teaching by the light of true knowledge, gradually teaching the whole truth. He still sheds such light and always will. For God, who never deceives us, promised this thus, I shall give you the spirit to abide with you forever. John fourteen sixteen. And again, behold, I am with you all days, even unto the consummation of the world. Matthew twenty eight twenty. That is, through the indwelling grace of the Holy Spirit. So the same Holy Spirit dictated the very gospel in those councils celebrated by the Orthodox Fathers. Gradually, he taught the whole truth, speaking nothing contrary to that truth. Therefore, you can now assuredly say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son, since what that same Holy Spirit appears to have expressed about himself only dimly in the Gospels, he later fully clarified in the various councils as the teacher of both of the Testaments. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, answered, You have joined together the texts of the Gospel and the sacred councils of the Holy Fathers appropriately, and you have credibly shown that the same Holy Spirit is the author of the Gospel and of the councils, as we also believe, thus honoring the councils with the veneration equal to our reverence for the Gospel. Truly, both we ourselves and many others of our sages do not dissent from you concerning the meaning of the Spirit's procession. But, as I have often said already, to speak so of his procession has not been our practice heretofore. We do not shrink from the meaning of his procession, for we understand it rightly, but rather we recoil from unfamiliar expression of that procession. Many Greek doctors who expounded the divine scriptures, although they clearly implied to us your very understanding of the Spirit's procession in appropriate words, nevertheless did not explicitly use the term procession, nor did they hand it down to us in our pattern of speech. Chapter 24 That many Greek writers have said that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son as from the Father. Anselm, Bishop of Hamelberg, then said, Why do you say this? The famous Athanasius, Archbishop of Alexandria, and fiercest disputant against the Arian heresy, perfect and learned in the Catholic faith, stranger to none of the Greek sages, spoke thus in his statement of the faith, The Holy Spirit is from the Father and the Son. He then added, Proceeding. Athanasius taught clearly that the Son proceeds from both when he referred to the Son's procession to both, just as he referred to the Son's being to both, especially since the Holy Spirit does not have his being from the Father and the Son in any other way than by procession. 
Didymus too was an important doctor of the Greeks. He published many books, among them three on the Holy Trinity, and commented on the work of Origen on first principles, that is, the Periarchon, leaving excellent explanations in these texts. This Didymus, deprived of his eyes, external sight, but perfectly illumined within, showed clearly that the Holy Spirit proceeds also from the Son, saying in his book on the Holy Spirit, translated by our Jerome, learned in the Greek, Latin, and Hebrew tongues, thus, the Holy Spirit, Spirit of truth and Spirit of wisdom, cannot hear what he does not know from the voice of the Son, since the Spirit is himself brought forth from the Son, that is God proceeding from God, and Spirit of truth proceeding from truth, consoler taken from consolation. So says Didymus. Indeed, the creed of the Council of Ephesus, with its 200 Greek bishops, makes clear in these words from what truth the Spirit proceeds, that is, although in substance he is the Spirit of the Son, and we understand that his person, according to which he is spirit and not son, is distinct. Nevertheless, he is not different from himself, for he is called the spirit of truth, and the truth is Christ, while the spirit proceeds from him even as he does from God the Father. Likewise, Cyril, bishop of Alexandria, begins thus in his eighth letter to Nestorius. To the most reverend and most God-loving, and so forth, if the Son is a spirit in spiritual substance, or if he is understood as such in his role as spirit and not as Son, still the Son is not distinct from the Spirit, for he is called the Spirit of truth, and the Spirit flows forth from the Son just as he does from God the Father. So too John Chrysostom begins in his 26th homily on expounding the creed thus, let the universal church rejoice. This very one is the Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son. He divides his own gifts just as he wills. And again in homily 28, in another explanation of the same creedal passage, he begins thus, The Spirit is over the fabric of the whole church, so we might believe that the Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son. Again we say this Holy Spirit is co-equal to the Father and the Son and proceeds from the Father and the Son. Believe this, lest evil talk corrupt your good customs. Yet again, see the sacrament of the Trinity everywhere. Behold, we believe in the Holy Spirit. This Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son and is joined with them in love. Augustine too, Bishop of Hippo, and legate of the province of Numidia in Africa, an illustrious man and the most eloquent of Africans in his explication of all the scriptures, who took part in many African councils, who wrote many books against the Manichaean and Donatist heresies, and published much exegesis of the Old and New Testaments, whose countless volumes are read all over the world as highest authority. That Augustine always clearly inserted into his writings much evidence about the Holy Spirit's procession from the Son. Jerome, Ambrose, Isidore, Hilary, and many other doctors in the Latin language, as well as Leo the Great, high priest of the great city of Rome, included in their writings many things about the Holy Spirit's procession from the Son. I do not set their writings before you, because among the Greeks the Latin doctors were perhaps not of such great authority in those times as they would have been if they were Greek. That circumstance is regrettable, yet peace was preserved between us and you, as it is said, God is not a respecter of persons, Acts 10.34, and the Spirit breatheth where he will, John 3.8. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, replied, I am pleased that you wished to adduce our doctors, but I ask whether you, although you are a Latin, accept the authority of those whom you named and that of our other doctors. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, then said, I do not exclude, disdain, reject, or judge worthy of rejection any gift of the Holy Spirit given to any faithful Christian, whether Greek, Latin, or any other race. On the contrary, I receive and embrace with an open mind every man who speaks and writes what is true and consonant with apostolic teaching. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, then said, I seem to have found a Latin who is truly Catholic. Would that more such Latins come to us in these times? Often when they come, they act superior even to everything great and wonderful. 
Never do they speak to us humbly and inclusively, but haughtily and tolerably. But, to return to our point, sometimes our doctors have written about faith in the Holy Trinity or about its creedal statement. Then, in the course of explaining their opinion, they may have happened to say that the Holy Spirit proceeds or flows forth from the Father and the Son. Yet, they did not say this with the precise meaning of procession or flowing forth, as that they attribute to procession from the Father. For what proceeds from the Father proceeds, strictly speaking, and because it proceeds in a strict sense, it is also said strictly to proceed. But when we sometimes read that the Spirit proceeds or flows from the Son, not even this is said in a strict sense, for the Spirit does not properly proceed or flow forth from the Father, rather strictly speaking. That Spirit proceeds from the Father as his first cause and origin. But if we sometimes read or say the Spirit proceeds or flows from the Son, we do not say this in a strict sense, nor is it strictly speaking the case, because what is from the Son, or what proceeds or flows forth from the Son, is not so, or does not so, as from its first cause. For the Son is what he is, that is, the Son. He sends the Holy Spirit proceeding or flowing from himself, not from himself as himself, rather from the Father as his own first cause and principle. Therefore, as I have said, we do not properly say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father as from his first cause. So, the wisest of the Greeks have distinguished this procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father, from his procession from the Son, ascribing the first cause of his procession, strictly speaking, to the Father, from whom the Son is by begetting, and from whom the Holy Spirit is by procession. Moreover, they have ascribed the procession of the same Holy Spirit to the Son, but not in strict terms, since the Son is not of himself, nor is he his own cause, and neither is he, strictly speaking, the first cause of the Holy Spirit, in the sense that the Spirit proceeds, strictly speaking, from the Son as he does from the Father. Therefore, the Father is of no other, the Son is, strictly speaking, of the Father, and the Holy Spirit is of both. Nevertheless, the Spirit is strictly speaking of the Father, since the Father is of no other, while the Spirit is not strictly speaking of the Son, since the Son is not of no other but of the Father. And that Son knows from the Father that the Holy Spirit is of the same Father. And so I concede that the Holy Spirit proceeds strictly speaking from the Father, who is of no other, but he does not proceed, strictly speaking, of the Son, who is himself of the Father. This distinction, as I have already said, is what the wisest of the Greeks have established. Chapter 25. That the Holy Spirit, although he proceeds from both the Father and the Son, nevertheless is found in both the Latin and Greek authors to proceed, strictly speaking, and principally from the Father. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, then said thus, We do not deny that the Holy Spirit proceeds strictly speaking from the Father, because our own doctors have taught us this very thing, whether they learned it from yours or yours from ours. Whence our Jerome says in his explanation of the Catholic faith, expounding the Council of Nicaea, We believe in one Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father. We find in Scripture that the Holy Spirit is true God, and that he is, strictly speaking, of the Father. And again. The Son and the Spirit are, strictly speaking, of the Father, and the Spirit is truly of the Father and the Son in his procession. Therefore, except first that the Holy Spirit is, strictly speaking, of the Father, as Scripture says, by the word of the Lord the heavens were established, and all the power of them by the Spirit of his mouth. Psalms 32.6 And the Savior says, The Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. John 15.26 Again, the eminent doctor, the blessed Augustine, says in On the Trinity, Book 15, Chapter 17, In this Trinity, the Son and no other is called the Word of God, and... This is for a purpose, 
so the Holy Spirit, no other is called the gift of God, nor is the word begotten from any other, or does the Spirit proceed principally from any but God the Father. Again, in book 15, chapter 17, and the Holy Spirit proceeds principally from him of whom the Son is born. Moreover, I have added the word principally because the Holy Spirit is also found to proceed from the Son. But the Father granted this to him not as to one already existing, but not yet having this property. Rather, the Father gave whatever he gave to the only begotten word in begetting him. The Father begot the Son in this manner, so that the good common to them might proceed from the Son also. Augustine again writes in chapter 26 thus, Just as begotten from the Father without any change from the Father's nature attributes to the Son an essence without beginning in time, so does procession from both attribute to the Holy Spirit without any change from the Father's or the Son's nature, being without any origin in time. And again in the same passage, the Son is born from the Father and the Holy Spirit and Son by their joint gift, without any interval of time. And below, the Spirit is not begotten from both, but as Spirit of both proceeds from both. And again in the next chapter, we cannot say that the Holy Spirit is not life when the Father is life and the Son is life. Thence, just as the Father, having life in himself, grants to the Son that he also have life in himself, so the Father grants to the Holy Spirit to proceed from the Son, just as from the Father himself. According to these words of the blessed doctors Jerome and Augustine, we must then concede that the Holy Spirit proceeds strictly speaking and principally from the Father as from a first cause, because he proceeds from the Father as if in the first instance, and the Father has the Spirit from no other, rather from himself. Certainly the Father is the first cause and not the cause of the first cause. Indeed, since the Son is not of himself but of the Father, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son, not from himself, but rather as he has this attribute from the Father, from whom he also has being by begetting. So the Father is the principal author and causal principle of procession for the Holy Spirit, as he is of the begetting of the Son." Even if the Spirit is not ordained to proceed strictly speaking and principally from the Son, nevertheless, as it is true that he proceeds from the Father, so is it also unambiguously true that he proceeds from the Son. We must acknowledge no inequality of his procession, since we have affirmed here that the Spirit proceeds equally from both. Although the Spirit proceeds from the person of the Father, he nonetheless also proceeds from another person, that of the Son. Yet we must not say that there are two different per processions or two Holy Spirits in the way that the two persons of the Father and the Son are different. We must say rather that only one procession is from both. This procession is not from the Father and afterward from the Son. Rather, the Holy Spirit's procession is one and the same, eternal and substantial simultaneous from the Father and the Son, that Holy Spirit proceeding from both Father and Son at once and together substantially and eternally as one with the Father and the Son in their respective persons, that is, in the plurality of persons, constitutes the entire Trinity. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, responded thus, Now we seem able to agree for we find that our doctors and yours never have disagreed in this opinion. If we understand their writings correctly, however, both you and we find that they have written carefully about this question. But what do you say about this, that some sages among the Greeks say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son? Chapter 26 that some Greeks and even Latins think that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son and that they adduce inappropriate imagery. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, then said thus, 
I am not aware that such matters have been addressed or even suggested, and so, at the moment, I do not know how I should respond to this except as the Apostle admonishes. Avoid novelties of words. 1 Timothy 6.20 Those who say these things know what they mean. As for me, I read of notions of this sort in Book 12 of On the Trinity by Hilary of Portiers, bishop and famous doctor. There, this Hilary speaks to God the Father about the Father and the Son in your Holy Spirit, arising from you and sent through him. Again, your Holy Spirit is from you and through him. Let me adore you, our Father, and let me win the favor of your Holy Spirit, who is from you through your only begotten Son. Hilary says these things, and I think we can understand them according to our prior conclusion that the Father and the Son send forth the Holy Spirit, who thus proceeds from both, and the Father takes this attribute from no other while the Son has it from the Father. But that the Holy Spirit should proceed from the Father into the Son, and thus the Spirit proceed through the Son to sanctify creation, so that He does not proceed at the same time from Father and Son alike, is entirely absurd to say or even think. Granted, some wholly ignorant people who purport to be theologians foolishly propound this notion, so revealing their stupidity, Thus they say the Son of Man proceeds from the Father in his mother, and proceeds from the mother into the world, taking his being in nature from the substance of both. So they say that the Holy Spirit is truly of the Father into the Son, and through the Son the Spirit proceeds to sanctify creation. Men who speak thus, since they are in time, speak temporally, deceiving themselves and ascribing temporal qualities to what is eternal. For when the Son of Man proceeds from the Father into his mother, he does not then proceed from his mother into the world. And when he proceeds from his mother into the world, he does not then proceed from the Father. So then these who offer this inappropriate image are consequently drawn into error and into just condemnation for it. Others, overreaching themselves in theological discussion, even as they fall short of true theology, have framed an equally inappropriate image. They say that just as a lake is said to proceed from a spring and not from a stream but through a stream, that is when the water of the lake comes out of the spring into the stream and arrives through the stream at a pool, so too the Holy Spirit is said to proceed properly from the Father as if from the highest source into the Son as if into a stream, and so through the Son as if through a stream for the sanctification of men as if into a pool of this world. But I am astounded and recoil from such comparisons between the comprehensible and the incomprehensible. For these images are so far below what they would suggest that they communicate no knowledge of the truth, rather thwart minds attempting to understand. Such minds then often turn away from right faith, shut the path of learning divine and spiritual truth by a heavy weight of physical imagery. Those who walk in faith instead set aside all such images, casting them behind and advancing in faith through their speculative intelligence, lifting themselves beyond themselves and climbing to the heights. So let those remain behind who walk in reason and cling to only the semblance of truth, loaded down with the burden of human ignorance and oppressed by the deep sleep of false opinion. They rightly fall behind because they set reason before faith, so are unworthy to go beyond reason with faith leading them. Such ridiculous metaphors are never suggested by the wise. Indeed, as we have already agreed, I think we should embrace the Catholic faith concerning the Holy Spirit's procession from the Father and the Son. But perhaps we might yet discover some unknown text that we should accept and study on account of the dignity of its author, such as the writings mentioned here of the Bishop Hillary, a great authority in the church. Even if that text, I say, should seem to imply something strange, yet we should read and thoroughly explain it so that we understand its harmony with Scripture and so attain to the law of charity with our Catholic understanding. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, then said thus, we know that this Hilary, the Bishop of Portes, of whom you speak, took part in many Greek councils of old. He both was and is greatly esteemed among us. You expounded his writings before us carefully just now. 
We too, if we ever found similar things in the books of our doctors, would discern their meaning in like fashion. For when exact meaning on some matter is clear in Holy Scriptures, prudent readers may easily direct other writings towards their true meaning. Therefore, you should know in your charity now that we have made so many arguments and adduced so many authorities that I and indeed all the Greek sages concur in your opinion about the procession of the Holy Spirit. But you must not think that we confess this because we were bested by you in this disputation. Rather, wise Greeks have already held such a view when this very question was presented humbly by wise Latins. Then the Greeks have confessed with their mouths what they believed in their hearts. Indeed, all writings about this question, framed by the law of charity, from Latin and Greek sages alike, have agreed as one. But nothing that foolish Greeks and arrogant Latins speak and argue about among themselves matters to us. Chapter 27. On agreement on this question and on removing this obstacle between the two peoples through the authority of the Roman pontiff in a general council. Anselm, Bishop of Avalberg, answered thus, Let us give thanks to the Holy Spirit who has willed that we put an end to this question in brotherly peace and acknowledgement of agreement in the presence of many men who share our view. Nothing remains now but that you teach and write without reservation even as you believe that the Spirit proceeds from both Father and Son and that you maintain this agreement concerning the faith with the Holy Roman Church, Mother of all the churches, which also teaches and writes this truth. For he who does not love the unity of the church does not love God. He who is opposed to that unity, according to the blessed Ambrose, Archbishop of Milan, is surely a heretic, and whoever buttresses himself with presumption and obstinacy sins without the mitigation of ignorance, so the more gravely when reason and authority overcome him. Your holiness and my humility require, since we are bishops, not only that we teach wisely what we know, but also that we patiently learn those things about which we may perhaps be ignorant. Nicetus, Archbishop of Nicomedia, replied thus, I embrace your humility, beloved brother, and I acknowledge with admiration your devotion to the truth of faith. I cannot but be moved when you speak. I assent to everything you have said, and I affirm it with all my mind and body. But we cannot suddenly present these words, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son, to be taught or written openly, without scandal among the ordinary folk, or to those less informed, since up to this point such words have not been heard openly in Greek churches. We must rather celebrate a general council of the Western and Eastern churches by the authority of the Holy Roman Pontiff and with the approval of our devout emperors. At such a council, these and several other essential matters concerning God might be set forth such that neither we nor you lack understanding. Thereafter, all of us in Christian East might, in unity with the Holy Roman Church and with other churches in the West, freely accept, preach, teach, and write that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son with common will and equal agreement, without any scandal on our part, we might then introduce it in the public signing of the Eastern Church. Anselm, Bishop of Havelberg, then responded thus, Would that I witness this, that I be found worthy to take part in so holy a council, where Peter, as Prince of the Apostles, through his vicar, the Roman pontiff, might take his seat in the universal church entrusted to him by God and gathered together as one. There the Holy Spirit of whom we have treated might come down upon us all to teach the whole world at that moment and forever to the end of the world, making all one in Christ with Peter and in the faith of Peter. Let it be so, let it be so, let it be so. God wills it, God wills it, God wills it. Doxa si o theos, doxa si o theos, doxa si o theos. All present then called out, it is good, it is good, it is good. Thus let it be done, let it be done, let it be done.